Hi, this is Margaret Jansen. I just wanted to confirm my video was um, coming through. You are clear. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and I think we're almost there. We're just solving for our last um, early group presenter here. Um, we are not seeing. We will try to continue to connect with Steve. Off in the emails as we are not seeing him on the list. Um, currently, it's possible he has not clicked join all the way in, but we do not see his name. Uh, um, there's two calling users. I see. I wonder if he's. One oh, did he dial in? Okay. Um, we will. We will continue to email him and um, request that he joins the. The link if possible. Um, yeah, I think that would be. What we need to do, unfortunately. And uh, this is John Williams from NYSERDA. And just for the attendees, um, you know, we are just looking to link in the last member of the first panel. So we will get underway just as soon as we have everybody lined up. We'll be right back. I just spoke to Steve Whitley. He's going to try and call in. Okay. Thank you for helping us troubleshoot. Much appreciated. No problem. All right, I think we are in the process of unmuting the phone attendees. So if you are a phone attendee, um, bear with us. Uh, we are attempting to ensure that we can connect with our last uh, speaker that we are aiming to, to have on the line. Um, I think that we have uh, been able to reach a stage where we have some call-in uh, attendees unmuted. So if you are um, our last speaker, which is Steve Whitley, um, if you're able to, to just chime in from the phone, uh, we should have unmuted you. Um, so let us know if you can, can you speak? Are you on? This is Steve. Do you hear me? Wonderful. Yes, we can. And we see that you are calling user 13. So we will unmute the others. 
Thank you, Steve. And Steve, you need to speak a little louder. Okay. How's this? That's better. Great. All right. Um, I think that that works well. Um, all right. Well, then I think we have our last attendees. So over to, um, I believe, John Williams. Right. Good. And I'm coming through. Okay, Farah. Yep. You sound good to me. Okay, good. All right. So maybe we can um, get started and um, thank you to our um, presenters today. And thank you to all of those in attendance as well. And, um, Today we'll be um, uh, here in a session uh, to hear about reliability planning. And the intent of this session is to try to engage experts on electric system reliability planning for the purposes of helping to inform the development of our scoping plan as required by, the, uh, by New York's Climate Act. And so the format for today will be a series of presentations, each of those presentations around 15 to 20 minutes or so, followed by about a 15 minute question and answer session. Um, and then once we are finished with that section of our discussion, we'll move on to our next um, expert, uh, looking today for a total of presentations about three and a half hours. So um, a big agenda and a lot to work through um, this afternoon. Um, I'll ask attendees that um, if during uh, the presentations you're able to pose um, questions in the Q&A feature, and we ask you that you direct your questions to all panelists or everyone just so, um, you know, uh, we're able to make sure we're seeing that question, and then um, we'll be able to moderate the, the Q&A section of, of each of the presentations um, uh, as best as we can. And uh, just for everybody to understand, we will be recording um, this meeting and um, a copy of that video, as well as all of the slides you'll be hearing and seeing today um, will be posted on the Climate Action Council website uh, as soon as we can. Okay, and with that, let's move on to the next slide, uh, just for a quick walkthrough of our agenda today. So the presentations that you'll be hearing are from the New York State Reliability Council, and we'll have a panel from Meyer Sasson, Steve Whitley, and Roger Clayton. We'll then hear from the New York System Operator, New York Independent System Operator, and we'll hear from Zach Smith. Then we will move to Margaret Jansen and Ryan Howarth, um, representatives of the Utility Consultation Group, Tammy Mitchell from DPS, and we'll also hear from Stephen Roundtree of Vote Solar. And then we will round out with Aaron Hogan from the New York State Department of State Utility Intervention Unit. And with that, again, I had said, it's going to be a pretty full agenda. And why don't we move um, just right into our first panel presentation? And that will be, and on the next slide, we will hear from uh, Meyer Sasson, the chair of the executive committee of the New York State Reliability Council, as well as Steve Whitley and Roger Clayton. And with that, Meyer, I will hand the mic over to you. We might have you on mute, Meyer. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Is that better? <laughs> there you go. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So. As John said, I'm Myers Sasson, Chair of the New York State Reliability Council. Participating with me in this presentation is Steve Whitley, former CEO of the New York ISO, and Roger Clayton, past chair of the Reliability Council and current chair of its Reliability Rules Subcommittee. In 2019, I'm sorry, in, in 1099, you can get me. My numbers right. 2099, uh, New York enacted the, no, I have it all wrong. In 2019, New York enacted the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, the CLCPA, one of the most aggressive trans transitions in the world towards a cleaner environment. 
the Climate Action Council was charged, as John said, with developing the scoping plan to meet CLCPA requirements. NYSERDA, the DEC, and the PSC have already issued orders uh, along those ways. The transition process, therefore, has already started. Next slide, please. We're pleased to be here at the Climate Action Council session on reliability. Reliability is part of our name. The Reliability Council was formed and approved by FERC in 1999, same year as the NISO, and was charged with maintaining pre-existing reliability standards in New York and promulgating new ones consistent with those of NERC and NPCC. Our standards are mandatory over the NISO, and we monitor NISO's compliance. Today, Steve will be discussing the complexities of planning and operating the high voltage grid uh, with mainly intermittent, non dispatchable clean energy resources. While Roger will delve into how much clean energy capacity will be needed to maintain existing levels of reliability. I am sure all will agree that reliability is critical to society today and in the transition to meeting CLCPA requirements. After all is said and done, we want to leave you with the following message. Given the intermittent nature of clean energy renewables and the CLCPA requirements for a decarbonized economy, we will need not only to replace the current fleet of non-nuclear power plants with clean energy resources, but also to add substantially more of these resources to not degrade reliability, some of which will need to be based on yet to be developed technology. That is our message today. Uh, next slide, and I'll hand it over to Steve Whitley. Thanks, Meyer. Uh, the title of the slide is Operating the System Reliably, but it's all about keeping the lights on. And uh, if you look at the first bullet, it's about that the operators uh, have available, dispatchable, and non energy limited resources today to use today in New York. And let me define what I mean by dispatchable. That Those are uh, generating units that the operators can call online, and when they're online, they will respond to operator signals to go up or down. They can provide ramping power to meet the load as the load increases, and they can provide frequency response to adjust generation to make sure frequency is balanced across the eastern interconnection. And when I talk about energy limited resources, I'll just give some examples. Uh, some good examples of non-energy limited resources would be like a nuclear plant. It can sit there and produce energy hour after hour after hour. And the gas plants that we have on the, on the system are connected to a gas pipeline, for, which provides hour after hour of, of gas supply so those units can operate and, and meet the, the definition of dispatchable. An example of energy limited resource uh, would be a battery because batteries have a limited amount of energy and then they have to be recharged. So moving down to the second set of bullets, I want to talk about um, keeping the lights on from the standpoint of the, the control center at the NISO and the operators and their job every day. And certainly we've already learned that operating with a large amount of uh, energy limited resources is difficult. If you look at bullet number two there, uh, the operators have to make sure generation and load are balanced every six seconds because going to number three, if that, that gets out of balance, it could cause the system to become unstable and collapse. And you certainly don't want that to happen. Item four, the operators not only have to make sure they balance generation and load inside their control area and, and move generation up and down for that, but they also have to make sure that 
flows on the transmission system are managed uh, to maintain reliability, and they do that by dispatching generation up and down. And certainly item number five, we've, we've learned that the availability and dispatchability of different types of reserves is critically important. Number six, the operators have to maintain the grid so that transmission lines and substations don't become overloaded. They exceed their thermal ratings. Voltage must be maintained within a high and low limit to keep from damaging equipment. Uh, unit stability and system stability needs to be maintained and frequency requirements need to be met uh, across the whole Eastern interconnection. Item seven, we've learned that fuel redundancy is critical during peak load periods and, and resource shortages. Uh, that became really clear to us in New York when we had the polar vortexes. And item eight, we also need something called black start resources, which are needed to restart the system after a blackout. And those must be resources that are located within our own system and not from the outside. So they're needed to re-energize the transmission grid so that other units can be energized. The next major topic is that planning uh, is required to identify the transmission and generation needs to meet reliability standards today. So our planners and, and certainly the Public Service Commission have been involved in making sure that we have adequate transmission and generation today. And as we look down the road at this new environment we're heading to, we need to recognize that planning and uh, at the concept level and approval, siting, permitting, engineering, procurement, and construction can take up to three to 10 years to get a generation and transmission built. Moving on to the next slide, let me mention something about the future system from the operating perspective. Uh, certainly we've learned that as renewable resources increase, the way we plan and operate the system must, must evolve. Uh, the way we plan and operate today is based on the current mix of resources we have today. The second bullet, uh, we know that with limited fuel diversity and over dependence on energy limited resources will be a risk to reliability that we need to manage. And if you look at recent events in California and Texas, which have been on the leading edge of, of getting uh, renewables and intermittent resources on the grid, we can see a picture of what might happen in the future if we don't address it pro properly. So the bottom line is that operators will need additional dispatchable and sustainable energy resources to meet uh, the reliability requirements of the future. Moving to the next slide called installed reserve margin, in order to protect reliability, we need to ensure there's an adequate supply of resources. And the NYSRC does that by uh, establishing an annual installed reserve margin called the IRM. The IRM establishes the minimum amount of installed capacity margin above the estimated peak load to meet our Reliability Council NPCC's requirements that the probability of shedding load is not greater than one day in 10 years. The NYSRC does this by con conducting a probabilistic analysis of generation and transmission and demand response to determine the IRM requirements. Now Roger is going to give you a good example of how this is going to be more difficult in the future. Roger? Thank you, Steve. Um, can I have the next slide, please? And the next one. Okay, this um, is an example, a hypothetical example of the solar impact on resource adequacy. There are going to be many challenges with the grid transformation to clean energy, including resource adequacy, uh, extreme weather, data and modeling of renewables, plus developing sufficient resources to plan and operate the system reliably. The focus of this presentation is on what may, may be the greatest challenge, that of resource adequacy. The graph illustrates the fundamental challenge 
to operating the system with high levels of intermittent resources. I used uh, PV photovoltaic solar as a hypothetical example based upon the NISO's 2020 summer peak load and the solar generation shapes over that peak day. For example purposes or demonstration purposes, I scaled up the actual solar generation uh, from last year on the peak day to a number of uh, 26,000 megawatts. If you, if you look at the graph, that's the green line. Uh, it, when the sun comes up in the morning, uh, it peaks at around noon and then dies away uh, at uh, about eight o'clock in the evening. The black line is the actual load without solar generation. The peak is at uh, 33,000 megawatts. It's a, uh, that occurs around two o'clock in the afternoon. And the red line is the one I want you to look at. That's the load minus the solar generation for this example. And you see it dips uh, at around uh, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock in the, in the morning, and then comes back up again such that at eight o'clock in the evening, uh, when the solar generation goes away, there is still approximately 29,000 megawatts of generation that is still required. So if you think that with conventional generation, like the resource mix we've presently got, um, it, it's sufficient to cover peak load uh, at 33,000 megawatts plus the uh, uh, reserve requirement, but let's think it's just 33,000 megawatts and it's constant uh, it, across all hours of the day. So you've got 33,000 megawatts of conventional, you've added 26,000 megawatts of solar, but you still need at eight o'clock in the evening, another 29,000 megawatts of the existing generation. So the only um, amount of generation that can be uh, retired as a result of adding this solar generation is the difference between 33,000 and 29,000. In summary, the net load at eight o'clock in the evening is 29,000, solar generation is zero. Therefore you need at a minimum 29,000 megawatts uh, of resources to reliably serve the load. And as I mentioned, that results in the ability to retire only 4,000 megawatts. Here's uh, an interesting conclusion also. The total resources are the sum of the solar that was added, 26,000, plus the 29,000 that is needed at 8, 8, 8 p.m. That's 55,000 megawatts. So the total reserve requirement is uh, 55,000 megawatts minus the 33,000. That's 22,000 megawatts. That's reserve that's required over and above that which is needed to serve the peak load. It's noteworthy that the current reserve requirement is 6,000 600 megawatts. Next slide, please. The previous slide was a hypothetical just to show the fundamental difference between intermittent uh, solar in this case uh, and conventional generation. Now this slide shows the results from a report that was sponsored by the Department of Public Service and NYSERDA, uh, came out this year, and it looked at the New York power grid uh, under a zero emissions uh, condition in the year 2040. The table uh, shows installed reserve for various categories of resource from 2025 through 2040. You can see that the sum in 2025 is approximately 49,000 megawatts, and in 2040, it's 
thousand megawatts. As a reference, the 2021 total resources is in the order of 41,000 megawatts. These uh, various resources are listed, thermal, nuclear, and so on. And it's noteworthy, I won't go through each one, but it's noteworthy that the thermal amount in 2040, an amount of 17,269 megawatts, uh, the report notes that uh, this generation is thermal generation uh, supplied with a fuel of renewable natural gas. Uh, it is characterized as a placeholder pending development of um, clean green hydrogen uh, uh, fuel and or um, long term uh, du long duration batteries. So this, this slide indicates that the total resources in 2040 are 88,000. The peak load from the, from the report for this case was 38,000. That means you need approximately 50,000 megawatts over and above that which is required to serve peak load in order to reliably serve the load and meet the reliability standards. Again, the current reserve requirement is 6,600 approximately. Next slide, please. Some observations. The two analyses that I presented, plus other studies, have all indicated a need for significant new clean energy resources in New York in order to meet CLCPA requirements and the reliability criteria. The new resources plus full development of all those sites presently identified in New York as suitable for solar and wind development will be required and will increase the New York reserve margin to unprecedented levels from the current 20% approximately to over 100% by 2040. These new clean energy technologies, obviously, must be emission-free. They must be dispatchable. That is, if you think of uh, solar during the night, it's not there, it's not dispatchable. Must be fast ramping, must be able to react quickly to events on the system that require generation in a very, in, in terms of seconds or minutes, and must have long duration storage capability. Therefore, the need for sufficient levels of new clean energy resources will steadily increase. This is not gonna happen suddenly in 2040, it's gonna start happening in 2025. Some of these resources rely on technologies that do not currently exist for utility scale application. So with that, I'd like to uh, turn it back over to Maya. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Roger. So, Today, we have discussed some of the reliability challenges that are faced in the transition to meet CLCPA requirements. We hope this has been helpful to you. In the appendices, you will find glossaries and on entities and terms used, together with notes on, Re on, the Re on Reliability Council governance and on the speakers. Each slide has the Reliability Council website where you can find the uh, IRM reports and Reliability Standards documents. We look forward to responding to any questions you may have. Thank you. John, back to you. Great. Thank you, Meyer and Roger and Steve. Much appreciate um, the thinking that you put forward on the table. Um, you know, just as a reminder to everybody, there is the Q&A function um, in the, um, in the, uh, on your screen. 
And um, that is where we'll be collecting any questions um, from uh, attendees uh, today. So currently we're not seeing any questions there, but maybe we can give it just a minute uh, to see if any questions will come in now. But, but, but maybe Meyer, I'll ask you if questions do come in, um, you know, either during the course of uh, this afternoon or, or maybe afterwards, if, um, you know, we may be able to call on you for um, a reply to some of that. Absolutely, John, for me or my colleagues. Great. We'll be here. Okay, and just giving it a minute to see if any questions will be coming in from the audience. We're getting, um, yeah, actually seeing one. Good. And so one question would be for um, for the panel: What is the fuel type used to determine the reserve margin? Uh, Roger, you want to take that? Sure. Uh, currently, it's all of the resources that are available in New York. Um, and uh, uh, whether it's gas or nuclear or uh, uh, anything, or wind or solar, those are all uh, legitimate resources that are modeled when we um, make the IRM calculation. Great, thank you very much. Um, another question has come in. Um, given the uh, Climate Act goals, Six gigawatts of solar, nine gigawatts of offshore wind, and three gigawatts of storage. Is this enough to meet reserve requirements? Um, you want me to handle that one? Yeah, go ahead, Roger. You're... Okay. Uh, yeah, the the um, CLCPA requirements of 9,600 and uh, 6,000 and 3,000 of storage that you mentioned, uh, they are far below the requirements that are shown uh, in that slide that I had. So the answer is uh, no, more is going to be required. Yeah, if I could add, to Roger, um, as, as we said in, in, our, in, our, in our thoughts that we wanted to keep with you, we have to replace all existing uh, non-clean energy resource, non-nuclear. So you have to start there, which is uh, uh, which is uh, uh, more megawatts than have been listed. But our our message is, you're going to have to do at least twice as much or more to maintain current levels of reliability. So it's a very good start. It's a very aggressive start, but it, it we need to do much more uh, than that. Great. Um, maybe this gets it to a little bit of that as well. Can storage is storage considered a equivalent to a um, a resource for reserve calculation? Steve, do you want to take that? Yes, the, the, of course, the storage depends on how many hours of operation it can provide. You know, New York is blessed to have a great pump storage plant called Gilboa that can provide hours and days of energy and gets recharged at night with pumping water back up on top. So those type of resources as storage are very, uh, very capable of, of helping meet the peak and providing ramping and all the things that we talked about earlier. But batteries tend to have limited energy and have to be recharged, and uh, that's not that's certainly not as uh, as strong a resource to uh, to meet our needs as something like pump storage is. Yeah, unless in the future you will get development with new technology of batteries that you could get batteries to store uh, fuel into Gilboa uh, at least twelve hours in a day and then being able to be charged at night. Roger, right. you want to say something? Go ahead. Um, no, I think that's covered. 
Okay. Okay, N another question, you know, with respect to the 50,000 megawatts that were identified as would be needed in 2040, I think this was, this was other research done, but if you know, um, were those, um, you know, what was the, were those limited resources or were they fully dispatchable resources? And what specific dispatchable resource technologies, if you know? Okay, um, that, that uh, slide lists all of the resources that were available. And uh, if you go down, the thermal uh, was, uh, as I mentioned, supplied by renewable natural gas. It depends upon how much renewable natural gas you've got. Uh, nuclear, hydro, those are conventional, conventional, we know that. Onshore wind, offshore wind, grid solar, uh, all of those are uh, uh, dependent upon the natural resource that uh, is energizing them. And so uh, if there is a big need for uh, a resource, they have to be available. And using the very simple, it may be a little unfair, but the very simple uh, example of the, uh, the solar that I showed on the on the chart. Uh, if the event occurs at night, then uh, the solar is not useful. Um, and and that really uh, and and you can say the same thing about wind. You know there are um, events with wind where uh, at least onshore wind. Uh, where uh, there could be days where there's no wind blowing, and um, you need those resources. The answer to both of those is some sort. Well, an answer is some form of a long duration storage. And together with the thermal, the thermal can be can dispatch, can provide dispatchable uh, uh, resources as needed. As well as the hydro, yeah, nuclear in, in, actually space loaded. In that uh, table is there's a line that says NYC TX. That's a transmission line uh, that's been proposed from uh, Quebec uh, into New York City. Uh, 1,250 megawatts. It's relatively small compared to the 50,000 megawatts that's needed. Um, but uh, you could consider that as being dispatchable also uh, using uh, resources in, in Canada. Great, maybe I'm gonna try just a couple more questions here before moving on. Um, one question here, do you consider energy efficiency and demand response in your calculations of load? What? In looking at the amount required, um, how do you measure load and is in, in an assumed amount of energy efficiency and demand response built in? Roger, why don't you take that because okay. this came out of this report. Yeah. Um, in that report, uh, there are, uh, this is for 2040, I'm, I'm thinking. Um, there are various scenarios looking at high load and, and uh, initial scenarios, and they take into account electrification. Uh, they also take into account uh, demand response. Um, the demand response is, is based on, on current market conditions and, and um, uh, technical constraints, but uh, maybe in the future, we're going to need a lot more demand response in order to fill that gap. Yes, as Steve said, it's, it's vital that at any moment in time we have a balance of resources online and load. And so the balance can always be if it, if be achieved by either uh, new generation coming online or dispatching generation up or by uh, demand response reducing the load but we need to keep those two uh, balanced. And that's what operators uh, and computers do at the energy control centers. Great. Um, okay, one, perhaps one more question, and I do see that there are other questions which we will do some follow-up with on, so so don't feel the questions will, will not go answered. But um, 
the question is recognizing this may be unknown and technologies are not currently commercialized at grid scale, but what do uh, reliability experts such as yourself believe are promising technologies that are emission free and dispatchable? And what are the promising technologies for long duration storage um, other than batteries or pumped hydro? This is Steve. I can answer that one. Uh, Go ahead. More pump storage, more pump storage plants. <laughs> you know, there's there's one in New York. There's one at TVA. There's one in New England. Uh, they're scattered around the country. They're very efficient and very uh, reliable, and they they provide a lot of energy that that can be dispatched. Can I uh, just add to that one? Uh, of course, pump storage is unique in that it, it needs uh, a reservoir that's higher up than the lower reservoir. And um, uh, those easy sites for development have already been done. Uh, and there may be limited uh, opportunities for new go blowers uh, in New York State. Um, I'd also like to comment on the, the, the question, which is, um, do we have an opinion on the resources? Well, we could have personal opinions, I suppose, of promising resources, I suppose, but we are neutral. Uh, we set the standards, the reliability criteria, and uh, all of the uh, potential resources have to meet that criteria. Great. Okay. Thanks very much. And um, um, I think we will need to move on just to stay um, as close as we can to the agenda. Um, to the questions that um, we have down, we will um, follow up with um, uh, some replies uh, from the panel and um, we'll make those um, responses available along with all of the other material. Um, so, uh, just before moving on, just want to say thank you to Meyer and Steve and Roger and much appreciate um, the time um, with us today and for the information that you've provided. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Okay, and um, let's move on to our next presentation and that will be Zach Smith, Vice President of System and Resource Planning at the NISO. And uh, Zach, um, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, John. Uh, thank you for the invite to speak here today. Uh, Reliability Council uh, friends did a great job opening us up. I'll um, I'll walk through uh, who the New York ISO is, uh, a, a bit of our planning process, and also touch upon some of our recent findings uh, in planning the grid, looking out as far as 20 years. It'll touch on similar themes as to what uh, Meyer, Steve, and Roger just discussed, um, uh, but I'll touch on a, on a few details. So uh, uh, happy to be here, and uh, I'll uh, I'll move ahead. Uh, next slide, please. So anyone uh, not familiar with the New York ISO, our mission uh, uh, in collaboration through our robust stakeholder process is uh, first and foremost to maintain and enhance reliability of the electric grid. Uh, we do that and support that through operating uh, competitive wholesale electricity markets, uh, and we uh, plan uh, the system to meet that reliability. And uh, through various efforts, we provide uh, information to policymakers, uh, to stakeholders, such as everyone uh, here today, uh, and various investors in the power system so that they can make uh, uh, what hopefully are intelligent decisions uh, in, in investing in the grid. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, one document of ours that I'd like to highlight and, and a, a good number of my slides are pulled from is our annual report called Power Trends. Uh, Power Trends for this year, 2021, uh, focuses very much on uh, the, the CLCPA and uh, how it will drive change in the electric grid and uh, what we feel we need to do collectively, not just the NISO, but with our stakeholders uh, through our transparent process uh, to you know, maintain reliability of the grid, have an efficient grid uh, to work towards achieving those goals, uh, but to do so reliably. 
so uh, again, first and foremost, uh, NISO's focus is, is on uh, maintaining reliability of the grid. Uh, we have challenges ahead of us uh, uh, based on a number of different uh, uh, changes on the system. Um, be it renewable technology. Uh, also, I mean, the whole reason for the CLCPA, climate change, uh, and the extreme weather events that we are seeing more and more often now, that in fact can Im impact the reliability of the system. Uh, we have to be, uh, you know, very proactive in uh, addressing those issues. Uh, and and being aware of what risks we may face and deciding, uh, you know, if we need to uh, design the system accordingly. Uh, and then, then there are various public policies, of course, that we'll talk about here today uh, that are driving that change. And uh, NISO uh, hopefully goes without saying is committed to a strong partnership uh, with all state agencies, uh, lawmakers, uh, market participants, stakeholders in uh, finding the most efficient and reliable way to achieve those goals of the CLCPA. Next slide, please. Uh, a, a key function of the NISO is uh, a wholesale electricity markets. Uh, in those wholesale electricity markets, we have to remain, we, the NISO, have to remain nimble uh, and respond as the system changes. And uh, uh, we go through uh, a, a significant process every year with our stakeholders to review uh, how our markets should change, how our market signals should change to be aligned with, uh, you know, where uh, New York is going, where New York is heading in terms of policies, in terms of resource mix, and with that resource mix, how the behavior of the grid is going to change and what changes in market signals do we need to make uh, to keep up with that change. Next slide, please. So uh, what I'm here today to talk about is uh, planning uh, the, the grid, uh, and I'll get into a number of details. Uh, through our planning process, uh, we provide information, as I described, uh, independent information. We have no stake in any given resource or, or facility or any given investment. Uh, we're entirely independent, and really what our focus is is on the reliability of the grid and the efficiency of the grid and uh, informing uh, stakeholders, investors, uh, our market design colleagues as to uh, what the best way is to achieve uh, that efficient grid. And that's really what I'll talk about today. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So, uh, system and resource planning at the NISO. Uh, four key highlights here uh, that, that I'll get into at least a few pieces of. Uh, our comprehensive planning process that I'll discuss here in a moment, uh, it looks at all the aspects that, Im that impact uh, the electric grid, be it load forecasting, uh, uh, changes in facilities, changes in resources, just ch changes in trends. Uh, and a lot of those changes, once again, are driven by public policy. Our comprehensive system planning process is uh, designed to be mindful of all of those drivers, reliability, economic, and public policy. And I'll get into that in a moment. Uh, we also have an interconnection process. And the purpose of our interconnection process is to ensure the reliability of the grid. So as new resources come along, new resources must uh, go through our interconnection process. And the purpose is to review each interconnection to make sure that when new resources come online, it does not degrade the reliability of the electric grid. Uh, all resources are welcome to interconnect as long as uh, they do not degrade the reliability of the grid. Another core function is forecasting uh, all the way from uh, the real time forecast that's used every day all the way out to we are now doing 30 year forecasts. Now that 30 year forecasting, I will admit, is pretty difficult to do, but given some of the policies and given what we're talking about here today, it really is vital. And uh, uh, with those forecasts, uh, we're able to provide uh, much more informative uh, studies and reports and uh, you know uh, outlooks on what the system may look like in the next few decades to help inform decision making and and you know what we need to be acting on today in order to maintain a reliable system through these next few decades and that's really what the last quadrant gets to uh, independently providing authoritative information uh, to make that proper decision making. Next slide, please. So our comprehensive system planning process. Next slide, please. 
I, I just touched on this briefly. I'm not going to walk through what each box here means, but just to show you our planning process consists of really three main legs that also have various inputs into them. Those three legs are reliability, economic, and public policy. And what I'm going to focus on today is our reliability process, what we go through in order to maintain reliability over the next 10 years. And then I'll also talk about what we go through to help inform decision making beyond those 10 years. But we do also have other aspects of our planning process, be it economic and public policy, but I, I won't talk so much about those today. Next slide, please. So our reliability planning process, one uh, key thing I'd like to highlight on this slide without getting into too much depth on process is a term on that first bullet that says bulk power transmission facilities. I think this is relevant uh, to what the reliability council started off discussing and then what uh, you're, you're likely to also hear after me from the utilities and from uh, some of the other uh, members of, uh, of the session here today. Uh, the New York ISO is responsible as a, a NERC registered uh, planning coordinator to oversee the reliability of the entire bulk electric system, which roughly is 100 kV and above. Under our planning process, under what we are charged in responsibility for under federal law, under our federal tariffs, are what we call bulk power transmission facilities. And roughly speaking, it's about 230 kV and above, and in the case of Long Island, it's 138 kV and above. So it's the higher voltage transmission system that if there are issues on that higher voltage transmission system, uh, it is the NISO's reliability planning process that is responsible for addressing those issues. And we address them through three key uh, reports and studies that are summarized here on this slide. One is uh, a, a STAR study is their acronym that you'll hear, short-term assessment of reliability. We conduct these on a quarterly basis. We produce them every three months uh, and they look out five years to understand what near-term risks do we have to reliability and what action do we have to take in order to maintain that reliability. That then has a handshake off into our longer-term reliability assessment called the RNA, the Reliability Needs Assessment. That assessment is focused on years four through 10. And between those, we are identifying what reliability needs do we have on the system in accordance with reliability rules set by uh, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, which is uh, NERC, uh, the Northeast Power Coordinating Council, and PCC, if you hear me use that acronym, and then, uh, of course, the first panel, New York State Reliability Council. The New York State Reliability Council rules are more stringent and more specific than anything from NERC or NPCC. So much of what we do in reliability planning is driven by the rules established by the New York State Reliability Council. When we have identified reliability needs driven by those reliability rules, driven by the system changing in, in, and attempting to comply with those reliability rules, we will either uh, find needs and seek to address them through finding solutions, or we will find no needs and then document that. Uh, either way, that gets documented through uh, the last major piece, and that is our comprehensive reliability plan. The comprehensive reliability plan focuses on 10 years uh, and, and you know, summarizes what our plan is to maintain reliability on the grid. Next slide, please. So I just touched on uh, most of what's on this slide. Really, our objectives are to comply with the established reliability rules and criteria. Uh, we do so through a series of studies that I just described. In those studies, it's important to point out that we not only focus on a single set of assumptions, but we also seek stakeholder feedback on various scenarios that could play out. You know, how does the future look? As you go out 10 years, we don't have a perfect crystal ball as to what that future is going to look like. So we look at different ways that that future could diverge, you know, different changes that could happen on the system and how those changes could impact the reliability of the grid. Then based on all of that, through an open and transparent process, we seek solutions uh, to the issues we identify based on the criteria and the rules established in our process. Our primary focus is on market-based solutions. So we want the market to respond. When we find a reliability need on the system, we want the market to say, here's the best solution we have for that. Here's the most efficient solution. We believe that that does result in uh, the, the most efficient solutions that we have on the system. However, 
if for whatever reason the market is unable to respond, perhaps not in a timely manner because of the nature of the reliability need, then we can turn to uh, regulated solutions and uh, you know identify and select a solution that would be needed in order to maintain reliability on the grid. Next slide, please. So uh, a, a recent development that I'd like to highlight that I think is, is quite relevant to the discussion here today uh, is uh, the DEC PICU rule. And I'm guessing everyone here is familiar with it. And I, I really believe that uh, the work that NISO did together with uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation and DPS and other agencies, along with the utilities, the work that we did really is a model for, uh, you know, in my mind, what should be thought about as we're thinking about long-term uh, policy goals and how to achieve them in a reliable manner. Next slide, please. So the DEC peaker rule uh, was adopted to limit uh, nitrogen oxide emissions or NOx emissions of simple cycle combustion turbines. These uh, generating types are typically referred to as peaking units because they serve load under peak load conditions. Uh, they're, they're, they're used in a limited time, but they are needed on today's system for reliability. Uh, through the NOx rule, uh, we worked with the DEC to uh, identify for one compliance plans uh, that were required to be filed back at the beginning of 2020 so that we could then factor that in to our planning process. And through that rule and through those compliance plans, there is actually a phased approach where at first the emissions are, the emission restriction is reduced down to a certain level for the year 2023, and then it's reduced again for 2025 to, to reach its final state. And through that phased approach, we anticipate that approximately 800 megawatts of generating capacity would become unavailable in 2023, and then 1,400 unavailable in 2025. So with that, that's a significant amount of generation, particularly given that it's being removed from New York City, our largest load center in the whole state. You know, the closer you are to the demand, the more efficient that demand gets served. And so by removing that generation from the local area, it really does pose some challenges to us in terms of where do we get that replacement power from? How do we move it across the system and get it to the customers to serve them reliably? This, this did pose some challenges for us, but uh, really what I'm highlighting here is the timing of it. The fact that we acted on this in 2020 for changes that are coming in 2023 and 2025. And through that multi-phased approach, we really were able to come up with a plan that as a result, right now today, I can sit here and say, we are not projecting any reliability needs during that time period. So next slide, please. So what we project, and I don't have the details here, but what we project are in fact tightening margins through 2030, which is the end of our reliability planning horizon. Uh, but they're tightening, but we meet reliability criteria right now. And it's thanks to that coordination and collaboration between the NISO utilities and state agencies to you know, anticipate what this change will be, have a solid understanding of it through the compliance plans from the generators, how do they intend to comply with the emission restrictions? We then utilize that in planning the grid, and then in turn, we have a reliable grid where we don't have to take any kind of immediate or urgent action uh, to make sure that people's lights stay on. We're doing it in a, in a planned, orderly, and prudent way, uh, and, and I really think it's a model for what could be used uh, going forward. Uh, for our reliability going forward, we do continue to see risks. Uh, it's very much driven by variability in demand going forward, particularly now with COVID-19. We're seeing you know, a lot of changes in society that can change uh, what that demand uh, uh, you know, pattern looks like across the state. And uh, we're keeping up with that, but that is creating some challenges. Uh, but just in general, the resource mix change uh, will drive challenges to reliability. And uh, it's just a plug or advertisement here. Uh, we are currently working on our comprehensive reliability plan, which will cover years 2021 through 2030. And uh, uh, stay tuned for that. That'll come out later this year. That'll summarize our plan to maintain reliability through that period. Next slide, please. So to that point, uh, let me talk a little bit about some of the scenarios that we're looking at. This really goes beyond what we would look at under normal process, really focused on uh, the CLCPA and how that's driving change. Next slide, please. 
So we conducted a climate change study, and that climate change study had multiple phases. Phase one uh, was focused primarily on our forecasting techniques. Now, uh, when we look at forecasting uh, consumer demand uh, and, and its behavior through time, uh, historical methods uh, were just that, historical. Uh, they would tend to look backwards and use uh, historical experience as a predictor for the future. And as I think we all know now, I mean, based on climate change itself, but also through various changes that are happening in society and through policy, it's really hard to use the past as a predictor of the future. And that was the focus on phase one of our study is to look at, uh, you know, how do we anticipate climate change to impact uh, temperatures, impact uh, uh, heating trends, cooling trends, and in turn, how would that impact the electric grid? And, uh, and, and that really turns into phase two of the climate change study. Next slide, please. And so before I talk about phase two of the, the study, just to highlight a few things about demand and load forecast, uh, my colleagues from the Reliability Council already described this a little bit. This chart uh, just highlights on a on a day by day basis, uh, like a day snapshot for each season, what a typical demand pattern looks like for a given day. So in summer, winter, fall and spring, you can see that hour by hour, this is a typical shape of demand uh, for New York State. And you can see that it differs pretty significantly from one season to the next, particularly when you compare summer and winter. And we're very mindful of that, particularly as we look out uh, beyond our near term planning horizon and start looking towards 2040, start looking towards the uh, emission free goal uh, and that target date for the CLCPA and what that may mean. Uh, and to that point, uh, there really could be a significant change between summer and winter. And uh, next slide, please, we'll, we'll highlight that. So this slide shows uh, uh, what our current uh, summer peak has been and what our current winter peak has been and how we are forecasting those uh, peak demand periods through time all the way out to about 2050. And you can see that right around in the 2040 time frame, and, and um, th this is not uh, this was not pre-programmed uh, to happen right when uh, the 2040 goal kicks in for CLCPA, but this is what we are projecting that right around 2040, uh, we would go from a summer peaking system to a winter peaking system. And that alone can really cause, uh, um, you know, some challenges in, in planning for the reliability. Uh, for, for our entire history, uh, for many decades, we have always been a summer peaking system. And the way the system is planned is very much focused on summer peaking. Uh, we all together will need to change our practices and to change our focus to understand much better about what will happen in the winter and what investment needs to be made in the grid in order to provide reliability in that winter period as well as that summer period. And you can see around the 2040 timeframe, I mean, there's going to be many years, at least that we're projecting, where it's going to be about equal between the two. So you have to design for the entire year, not just for a summer period, which has been the focus in the, in the past. Next slide, please. So to what I referred to, phase two of the climate climate change study took that load forecasting information and fed it into a very detailed model considering what energy would be needed in 2040 to meet the emission free goal of CLCPA while also taking into consideration some of the overall challenges with climate change, including extreme weather, uh, what impacts you might have from wind lulls, you know, if you have a lot of uh, wind power on the system, what happens uh, if the wind stops blowing very suddenly, how could the system react to that? An important point to make uh, with this chart that's on this slide, it, it, it uh, ties in nicely to what my colleagues from the Reliability Council were describing. This shows on an energy basis, meaning megawatt hours, uh, total energy served over a given period of time. This shows for the winter uh, how much energy we expect to be produced from wind, solar, and all the other resources on our system. And you can take a look at the center of the, the donut chart to understand what each piece is. What I want to highlight is the gray hashed area there. You see the acronym DEFRs, and that's uh, a term we coined calling them dispatchable emission-free resources. 
So on today's grid, basically that's the, the function that fossil resources serve today. Uh, as, as Steve Whitley described on the prior panel, uh, it, it has it, there are resources that have energy that can provide that energy today. And in the future, uh, some change in technology will need to take place so that it's not fossil resources providing that attribute anymore. We, the grid needs these attributes, and I'll, I'll get into a detail here in a moment, uh, to provide for fast response and serving load at times when the other resources aren't available. In our study, uh, without going into the hundreds of pages of details that came out in that study, uh, it really focused in on uh, or, or found that uh, about 10% of the years of the winter's energy would need to be served by dispatchable emission free resources. Uh, and uh, what form that takes, uh, I would say, is unknown right now. The question from the prior panel, you know, what what technology might that be? My answer would be, I don't know. Uh, uh, there's all kinds of potential technologies that could provide that attribute in the future. But the key is to understand from a technical basis what attributes are needed by the grid or in order to continue to rely reliably operate. And uh, we're saying that it's about 10% of the energy in winter. Next slide, please. Yeah. And Zach, if I could just ask you to think about a little bit of time to, to wrap up just so we can get to a few of the questions that are coming. Absolutely. Up. Yeah, I'm pretty close. Uh, and in fact, I'll skip this slide. Uh, and this actually, uh, funny enough, shows a very similar chart to what Roger showed. So I won't spend any time on that other than to highlight that, in fact, uh, ramping is a very important point. You can see the numbers here. Uh, that in a fairly short period of time, about six hours, you need to uh, ramp up by about 27,000 megawatts. If you want to have a frame of mind of what that means, you know, an average nuclear plant is about 1,000 megawatts or so. So uh, that would be a lot of power or, you know, an average combined cycle might be 500 megawatts. Um, it's a lot of power that needs to get ramped up fairly quickly. And in the future, we'll need to find uh, some dispatchable emission free set of resources that uh, can achieve that. Next slide, please. The 1 other thing I would like to highlight before I wrap up is uh, uh, the need to be able to deliver all these resources to the load center. So a, a lot of the discussion so far, and I expect for the rest of the day will be about these challenges of the resources themselves. But the fact is right now, our electric grid doesn't even have the, uh, the facilities to move the power around so that consumers can actually receive it. The map that you see here are load pockets, or not load pockets, generation pockets uh, that basically the transmission system cannot provide enough capability for the power to get out of those areas. So if you get significant renewable generation development within any one of those circles, uh, it's very likely that you're going to encounter constraints on the transmission system to actually move the power from the renewable generation to the load. And that's a very important aspect that needs to be resolved and uh, a lot more transmission is going to be needed to solve that problem. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. To the point about transmission, uh, just to highlight, I mean, we have made progress uh, through our public policy process in Western New York and on the bulk system on AC transmission, and also in the New York Power Authority is pursuing upgrades in, in the North Country. But contrasting this map with the zone map that I just showed uh, with the renewable generation pockets, uh, really more focus is needed uh, on the areas where the renewable generation is likely to develop. These transmission upgrades here were more about moving power from upstate to downstate or from west to east or from north to south. Uh, uh, more work is going to be needed on, on the local level, and uh, I'm guessing uh, my colleagues at the utilities will discuss more about that. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So I think I've touched on all of these key takeaways. Really, uh, you know, we are facing a number of challenges uh, in the future between meteorological uh, conditions uh, that really will drive the output of wind and solar and other resources. Uh, it, it'll, it'll, it creates a whole other level of challenge that compared to what we have on the grid today. Uh, we, believe, we believe we're up to it, uh, but we need a lot of tools in our toolbox in order to be able to do it. One of those tools could be battery storage uh, where they can help fill in the voids, but the problem there is that those still are energy limited resources 
and uh, they can fill the void only for a certain period of time, uh, they still need to charge back up. And so we do find that there are periods of time where uh, other resources will be needed. And uh, I've discussed where today the system is reliant on fossil fuel resources. We need to move away from that and find other technologies that can provide similar attributes as those uh, fossil fuel resources. And uh, I also mentioned transmission investment. We need that. And something I'll just highlight, you've already heard me say it a number of times uh, in the ISO through our process, we are committed to an open and transparent planning process to really provide all of this information to stakeholders that I've summarized here today. And uh, we're committed to continuing to provide that information and work closely with our with our colleagues across the industry and in the state uh, to help support the uh, goals, but to do so in maintaining a reliable grid. So again, I. I, I thank everyone uh, for the time and for the invitation and happy to take any questions. That was great, Zach. Thanks very much. Appreciate all the information and um, it certainly is a lot. So, and do have some uh, good questions for you. So, uh, recently the utilities indicated they will be seeking $17.4 billion in transmission upgrades given the current project queue. Is there an existing projection of what level of additional transmission will be needed to reach total reserve in terms of our first panelist. So it's a good question. Uh, they do somewhat go hand in hand, but they're also still somewhat of a little bit different of, a, of an issue. So uh, partly to my point, uh, more transmission is needed uh, to unlock those renewable resources. The renewable resources, many of them are likely to be sited in areas where the transmission grid just does not have sufficient capability to move that power out of those local areas, get it up onto the bulk grid and move it back down to consumers. And that's really where the transmission is needed. If you don't do that, well, then the reserve problem becomes even worse uh, where you didn't have those renewable resources in the first place available to you to serve load. Uh, so the transmission is really key just in terms of the overall resource mix of the grid. It still does not help resolve though, uh, the problem of uh, reserves and ramping and the need for, you know, on the, during the times when the wind stops blowing and you have clouds in the sky, so you don't get as much solar production, those types of things. And when the, after the batteries have tapped out their supply, you know, you still need some other resource there and you could have all the transmission possible across the state and that still would be true. Great. Uh, next question, the CLCPA has very specific dates requiring emission reductions and a build out of renewables. Can the ISO offer a general timeline to have the needed generation and transmission installed? Your view on the timing is important. I, that's a great question. I, I, and I think that's something we should continue to discuss uh, through a uh, NISO stakeholder process and through forums like this. Uh, there's not a specific timeline that I can offer here today, although I'll, I'll agree with a point that uh, Steve Whitley made earlier in the first panel is that, you know, it takes time. It takes time to plan the grid and it takes time to uh, enger, engineer, permit, uh, procure, construct all those steps. Uh, no matter what the resource is or whether it's transmission facilities, it does typically take years uh, to go through all of those steps. And that really gets to my, my primary point that I was making in comparing to the DEC PICA rule, that the sooner we know kind of what the long-term plan is and the phases that will be taken, the steps that will be taken to step into that, you can't do it overnight. Uh, what steps should be taken over time over these next 20 years to get to that end state and to the extent that we know what those steps are and the sooner we know them, the better uh, we will be able to plan the grid and to provide kind of a clear pathway uh, uh, for all stakeholders to participate in that planning. Mm -hmm. And uh, right, so maybe even still getting to the timing. So some are pushing for an even faster conversion to beneficial electrification for heating in order to meet the 40% greenhouse gas reduction goal uh, by 2030 for the state. So is, uh, is NISO considering a more accelerated scenario? Yeah, that's a great question as well. And, and, and quick answer is yes. Uh, when I discussed about uh, forecasting, uh, there's probably about 40 more slides I could put in about uh, how we're considering electrification and the impact it has uh, on, on demand, particularly when you try to take those forecasts out to even 30 years. 
Um, there are many different ways uh, that demand could play out over that period of time. And the main driver really is electrification, uh, be it through electric vehicles or through heating. And if there is a more accelerated course, then of course that could change what our planning is and change what the uh, risks will be to reliability and what actions we need to take. Uh, we highlighted this in a, in a recent uh, report. I, I refer to Power Trends, which gets issued around April, May timeframe every year. A sister, uh, a companion document with that is our gold book. It's our load and capacity data report. And uh, with that this year, we accompanied the report with numerous charts to help people understand exactly what impact electrification could have on these forecasts. And I really encourage everyone to check that out on the NISO website. Uh, it's pretty easy to get to if you go to our report section. Uh, it really gets into a lot of detail as to how that electrification could play out over time, and it looks at various scenarios. Great. Uh, I'm going to want to move on, but I think a couple of good questions also still for you, Zach. So um, uh, just maybe quickly. So is this 10% DEFRS? Uh, or DFERS, I'll just say, uh, is that winter need, 10% winter need or annual need? Great question, and actually it prompts a clarification I forgot to give. So um, the, the chart that's on that slide I showed was just for winter. Uh, for summer, off the top of my head, I don't recall what the number is, but here's the clarification or real emphasis that I wanted to share. Um, that's an energy number. So what that means is as you look on an hour by hour basis, you know, how, uh, maybe on percentage basis, how much of the time is a very simple way to think of it. You know, how much of the time is spent being served uh, by that type of resource? Relatively speaking, 10% is not that much. However, from an installed capacity standpoint, the installed capacity necessary to provide that 10% is very significant. And that's really what the point was with the ramping slide and also what Roger talked about in the prior panel. The, uh, the, the increase in power that you need at any given time is very significant. So you need the right amount of installed capacity on the system to respond when you need it. But then it shuts right back down again when you don't need it. So overall, the energy served to consumers is relatively little, uh, but, but the need at any moment in time could be quite significant. And it's important to keep that in mind. So uh, in terms of what you would get over the total year, I don't have that number off the top of my head, but uh, encourage people to go check out the climate change study for more information. Great. Um, and then maybe even just a couple more. Why can't current storage technologies and green hydrogen meet the dispatchable carbon-free need? Shouldn't those technologies suffice? Yep, another uh, great question. Uh, so uh, regarding storage itself, um, it gets to a point that I described. It certainly has a lot of the right attributes. Uh, the one concern is that how much storage would you need in order to have that available to you at all times? Uh, it's unpredictable uh, when these wind lulls may happen or when uh, the, 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 you know, the clouds may come in. You can predict them in a sh very short period of time, but in a long period of time, it's uh, it's much more difficult to predict, and so uh, the the issue with storage is energy limitation, and might you end up tapping out those resources too quickly, and then being left with nothing to serve load. So that's one challenge with regard to storage. But the attributes, uh, the right attributes, are there, and that is, uh, I would say, part of the solution at least. Uh, with regard to uh, green hydrogen or renewable natural gas or those types of uh, products, I absolutely think that that uh, should be part of the consideration. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, there are limited um, uh, instances of commercially available uh, installations of those today, uh, but that really gets to one of my primary points is, you know, work needs to be done to pursue these technologies to get these attributes. You could definitely have generation that's fueled by uh, hydrogen, for example, uh, that could meet all of the attributes I'm, I'm describing. And it's really just a matter of getting there with a commercially available technology. Yeah. Good, and um, I'm gonna just put this last one out there even though we are running long, but I think these are really great points and it goes to the challenge of um, analysis and future looking uh, modeling and et cetera. And it's variability in terms of meteorological conditions and we're certainly learning more about uh, the impacts of changing climate and, and a lot of different um, uh, means and potential impacts to systems, but then also like needed variability in how we think of demand and looking 
at low and high degrees of uh, penetration of EVs and heat pumps? And um, how do you, and I guess maybe the question is, how do you look at and address reliability uh, with these, um, you know, fairly significant variables um, in place? Yeah, it, it's, uh, it really gets into uh, a complicated process that we have through our forecasting team. Uh, I, I, have, I, can, I can toot my team's horn a little bit here and say that I just have an amazing team uh, in my forecasting department that really track all of those issues to try to understand what's out there, you know, what's behind the meter as well as what's uh, connected at the utility level and what behavior will all of those uh, things have uh, in the future uh, and how will it impact the reliability of the system. In the end, we need to have certain forecasts and in my mind, what we need to be doing is understand the, the bookends, if you will, of uh, how could that mix play out over time and making sure that we've planned a system reliably that can address that. Now, the other piece I'll say is from a market design standpoint is sending the right price signals uh, for the right behavior. And, uh, you know, it, it, to something I said very early on in my presentation, it's our interest to be thinking about, uh, you know, what's the best way, what's the most efficient way to reach a reliable grid. And we're always thinking about that from a market signals standpoint as well. What should be incentivized in terms of market behavior uh, to reach the most efficient outcome for a reliable grid? Okay. Great. Well, much appreciated, Zach. Thanks for um, thanks for the presentation, and, and certainly a lot um, uh, to be continued to be considered as we move forward with all of our planning. Um, Thank you, John. Really so much appreciated. Thanks. And uh, maybe let's just move on to our next um, panel of presenters, and these uh, we'll be hearing from. Um, folks from the utility consultation group. So maybe we go to the next slide. And um, we will uh, hand it over to Margaret Jansen from National Grid and Brian Hawthorne of Central Hudson. So, um, Margaret, am I handing it over to you first? You're actually handing it over to me, John. That's all for to you, Brian. Go ahead. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you very much. Good, good afternoon, everybody. As, as, as John said, my name is Ryan Hawthorne. Uh, with Central Hudson. I am the Vice President of Electric Engineering and Operations. With me today is, is Margaret Jansen from National Grid, uh, Director of New York Strategy and Regulation. We are here on behalf of the Utility Consultation Group, uh, talking through maintaining reliability as we, we navigate uh, New York's energy transition. Next slide, please. So just for context here, uh, what exactly is the Utility Consultation Group? It is a consortium of gas and electric companies across New York State, both large and small. Uh, we've really been working together uh, in tandem over the last several months, uh, really looking to serve as a resource as we interact with the Climate Action Council and the advisory panels. Um, throughout the advisory panel process, uh, we tried to act as a resource answering questions, uh, also providing uh, position filings on each of the recommendations as they are filed. Uh, we've been trying to work intently to meet with each Climate Action Council member, answer questions, offering assistance. Uh, I extend that offer again today for, for continued meeting and coordination, not only for those of the Climate Action Council, but any other uh, interested party that may be on today's session. For those that, that haven't met with us yet, we're happy to do so. We, we see ourselves as a, as, a, as a helping hand through this process. Next slide, please. So we all recognize that utilities have an important role in the clean energy transition. Uh, each member of the UCG recognizes the criticality of New York's energy transformation and are su fully supportive of achieving the CLCPA goals. As we have undertaken our interaction with the CAC and its advisory panels, we've drafted a set of principles that guide us in our thinking, uh, which you can see here on this slide. Of note, you will see that the importance of reliability really shines through in our principles, which is why we're here today with you. Next slide, please. The, today's presentation is re really going to center around three main themes. The criticality of electric reliability and its foundation for the clean energy transition. The long-term planning that goes into delivering on electric reliability, as you've kind of heard already earlier today, and the steps being taken to build for that future. And the UCG's position on how best to navigate this transition. Next slide, please. Every utility is charged with delivering safe and reliable service. Safely delivering reliable electricity to our customers is really priority number one for all the utilities. 
as the NISO explained, you know, they are responsible for securing the bulk transmission system. The utilities in turn take care of the local transmission and distribution system. Now, when we talk reliability, what exactly do we mean? Uh, reliability is the electric system's ability to avoid interruptions during normal operations and routine events, such as mild storms. Uh, that means the customers receive continued uninterrupted quality electricity. Naturally, when you talk about reliability, the conversation also tends to extend into resiliency, the system's ability to avoid interruptions for major events such as hurricanes that we've seen over the last several years, particularly in New York. But today we're, we're really talking about you know, the customer side of things. We start and end with the customer. Our customers need ener uh, energy service that's reliable and always there when called upon. That's what we're talking about today in the context of reliability on the coldest winter's night or on the hottest summer day, the lights and the heating cooling systems are on and working. We've seen what happens when reliability falls short in states like Texas and California. Millions are left in the dark or worse succumb to death from exposure to extreme temperatures. We can all agree that this cannot occur in New York. Energy supply and demand are balanced every six seconds across the state. Maintaining this balance is critical in ensuring that when the switch is flipped, your equipment turns on. This past year of COVID-19 only has further highlighted that need for of our customers for reliable service. With work, school, and home life all bundled together, any outage was seen as an immediate showstopper. As we move down the path of this clean energy transition, the criticality of electric reliability will only increase. As more components of people's lives are electrified from tra transportation to heating, designing and operating an inherently reliable system will be the bedrock for this journey. For generations, the distribution electric grid was designed for one-way central station power flow. With the rapid deployment of distributed energy resources over the last several years, and much more coming quickly, as the CLCPA, as you know, outlines a need for 6,000 megawatts of distributed solar, the traditional utility dynamic is changing to accommodate this complex two-way energy flow. As more intermittent renewables come online, maintaining the right power quality for our customers throughout changes in generation, as local cloud cover and wind speeds change, becomes more challenging. However, the utilities do welcome this challenge of re redesigning the grid to innovate the way we plan for clean energy to enhance reliability. Several utilities have embarked on grid modernization efforts to increase the visibility and control over the distribution system to levels never previously possible to anticipate potential issues and react immediately. Each utility is incorporating the CLCPA into its planning criteria, criteria identifying potential for renewable integration. Multi-value projects are considered for areas where upgrades are needed from a traditional infrastructure or reliability standpoint. Are there opportunities to modify the design to accommodate additional renewable generation and increase the area's hosting capacity? Next slide, please. Utilities conduct planning on its local transmission and distribution infrastructure annually, looking out over a five to 10 year horizon. During this process, capital budget plans for implementation and necessary changes are set. For many projects, the planning, permitting, procuring, and construction can take as little as one year. However, for large scale activities requiring transmission rebuilds or new substations and circuitry, this process can take upwards of five years. As both of the previous presenters noted, proper planning for the grid does take time. As larger distributed renewables seek to connect to the distribution system, each system is studied extensively uh, through a process known as a Caesar study process. John, do you mind backing up a couple slides? Keep going. One more. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. This review not only examines the utility's ability to serve this renewable generator, but also the potential effect this interconnection has on an existing customer surrounding it, ensuring it does not harm the reliability to the local area through items such as voltage fluctuations, or flickers, protection exceedance, or unintentional islanding. So as we move forward, what exactly is the utility's role? Uh, we, we feel New York's electric and gas utilities are new, uniquely positioned to anticipate challenges, innovate solutions, and optimize implementation plans to enable the clean energy transition. Utilities will continue to op uh, design and operate our systems reliably as we transition to clean energy, even though more thorough planning is needed. 
on the anticipation front, utilities now forecast over a thousand this times. You mind going back forward one? Thank you, sir. Utilities now forecast over thousands of times more, uh, more data points than we had only a few years ago, forecasting hourly loading and generation for each one of the thousands of feeders in New York. Forecasts now include electric vehicle chargers, electric heating, solar, batteries, and more. In working with the state and an ISO on the power grid study, utilities have analyzed what infrastructure investments are needed to deliver clean energy, developing local transmission and distribution projects. Many of these projects are underway or are starting. With the state's clean energy goals in place, the clean energy transition will require careful forethought and meticulous planning. Utilities have developed and continually update various roadmaps that illuminate the optimal pathway to a net carbon, net zero carbon future in documents like the 15 year plan and distributed system implementation plans, which are a five year plan that's updated biennially. On innovation, non wireless alternatives allow utilities to contract with third party owned generation to help reduce loading on constrained areas of the distribution system. This is a true win 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 where developers get additional revenue. Utilities enhance reliability and customers obtain the savings. Energy storage is essential to success as we move forward in the clean energy transformation. It can not only serve as a grid tool to manage intermittency and generation, but also support resilient designs like microgrids to solve, solve traditional reliability issues. One good example of this is National Grid's Old Forge storage project currently underway, a five substation region in rural New York where reliability for the Old Forge area has been one of the utility's worst performers annually. Utilizing storage at the end of the line, a dynamic microgrid is being formed to support this community. And when not called upon for the reliability need, the energy storage will participate in the NISO energy market. On optimization, the utility as a distributed system operator will actively manage the local electric system, including DER, by coordinating with customers, market participants, and the ISO to maximize whole system value. For New York to achieve its clean energy targets, many facets of our customers' lives will fundamentally change. In order to meet these needs, collaboration with all stakeholders is a critical necessity. One such, so one such example of this collaboration is with Con Edison and its uh, recently issued Climate Change Resilience and Adaptation Report, outlining how it's incorporating climate change into its planning, design, operations, and emergency response. This was developed in tandem with more than 50 stakeholders, including New York City. While the utilities serve as an important role in this transition as the operators of the electric and gas systems, we do truly value the partnerships and perspectives across the spectrum of those involved. Next slide, please. I will now hand it off to, to Margaret Jansen, who will speak to the transition itself. Thanks, Ryan. <clears throat> A few points on the transition before us. The utilities are optimistic. We see the objectives set out in the CLCPA as feasible. And we recognize that for the transition, it needs to be orderly. We need to keep the lights on while safely delivering energy to our customers in a cost effective manner. It's clear that in order to meet the challenge of the C LCPA targets and design the transition that will lead to a success, that multiple technology options need to be explored. This is not a simple either or solution. It's an all and above approach that would be necessary to achieve the emission reduction goals in a reliable and affordable manner while not leaving some customers behind. The transition period should incorporate zero carbon and low carbon options to enhance overall energy reliability and affordability. This statement is based on analysis. The research backs a balanced approach. Several consultants have identified the need for dispatchable zero emission fuels like hydrogen to achieve the 2040 goal and decarbonization of all the sectors. And a list of these studies isn't provided in this slide deck for, for reference. It would be premature for New York to abandon technology options at this early stage before the state's integration analysis and other studies are completed. And there are some exciting developments underway on zero emission fuels. On July 8th, New York State announced it's going to explore the potential role of green hydrogen as part of a comprehensive decarbonization strategy, including participating in a hydrogen strategy study with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory 
and also NYSERDA joining the High Blend Collaborative Research Partnership, where the Department of Energy has allocated over $12 million to fund accelerated research on blending hydrogen into systems. As we're developing solutions, lessons should be learned from other states and countries. Reliability does not have to be sacrificed in order to transition to clean energy if the planning is done right. Utilities welcome this challenge of redesigning in order to enhance reliability. And the timing and orderly transition is key. Adequacy of the transmission and distribution systems is needed in order to, in order to successfully implement decarbonization and electrification. We look at the electric markets around the country, how they're transitioning and contrast and consider our local conditions. We see California's attempt at market. We look at ISO New England, PJM, how Texas set up their markets and its impact. What we see here in New York is a strong framework for solutions. Our New York electric markets are robust with a responsive stakeholder process in order to adapt market rules to bring on renewables while protecting reliability, as you heard from the Reliability Council and New York ISO. Also, we can learn from global experiences. For example, an examination of hydrogen's decarbonization potential has progressed further in Europe and the European Commission had um, issued a strategic roadmap for hydrogen involving repurposing of existing infrastructure and acknowledging that hydrogen can be a fuel, a feedstock, an energy carrier, and storage. And it has possible applications across industry, transport, power, and building sectors. I'll close with the last point that utilities are a key partner in working with the state on planning and implementing this energy transition. We have the deep institutional knowledge and experience across our organizations, and we're in other jurisdictions as well, where we're able to leverage our knowledge to optimize solutions for New York. And with our capital resources and financing capabilities, we're already investing in emerging technology and energy resources, as well as proactive investments in modernizing energy systems and addressing the accumulation of distributed generation system-wide, creating a more robust network backbone and reducing project-specific construction costs. New York's utilities have a long history of successfully implementing energy transitions as the state's energy portfolio has evolved. We recognize that decarbonizing our energy systems will require resolving many questions, seeking new partnerships, technologies, energy policies, utility regulatory models, and transformative investments. We are eager to collaborate on solutions and step up in addressing these challenges. Next slide, please. And this ends our prepared remarks. I want to leave this resource list. Um, this has live links for the council's reference. As I had mentioned, these are the recent technical studies that point to multiple pathway solutions in order to achieve CLCPA targets in a reliable, cost-effective manner. And we are happy to take uh, questions from the council at this point. Great, well, thank you both Margaret and Ryan for, for all of that very, uh, uh, very thoughtful and thanks for the, the input. Um, just running through a couple of the questions that have been submitted. Um, the first going to um, the criticality of reliability um, when we're looking at electrification technologies, but also that there is um, existing need for electric reliability considering fossil um, based systems, um, both for businesses and homes also do require electric power in order for them to actually provide the appropriate services. So potentially, uh, could you speak to the way that you think about reliability for um, kind of existing systems that depend on electric power, but also future systems that will continue to rely on electric power. Sure, John. Yeah, I, I, I you know, obviously today's heating systems typically do require uh, electric power to, to, to start. However, it's typically not a, a, a high load. As we look, move, as we move to 2040, as, as uh, Zach Smith's presentation highlighted, we, we move from a summer peaking system to a winter peaking system, 
potentially doubling what our winter peak loads are. This is this is really what I'm talking about when I'm talking about criticality of, of the reliability system. Obviously, you know, everyone's everyone needs needs reliable power today and tomorrow, but as we move down this path and, and your heating systems are now more electrified, your transportation is more electrified, lights go out, you're, you're not going anywhere and you're in the dark and you're in the cold. That, that's what I'm talking about when I, when I speak to the criticality today and in the future. Okay, great. Um, I think I'm gonna try to condense maybe two questions, both of which seem to be getting at the timelines needed for effective planning, budgeting, permitting, procurement, construction uh, of the distribution infrastructure, and particularly with respect to, um, you know, the nature of the changes that um, that we're looking at um, in terms of meeting the, uh, you know, the goals of the Climate Act and what we're projecting as a potential increased demand of 65 to potentially 80 percent and what is required in order to make sure that we are doing all the effect, you know, the, the appropriate planning for effective realization, both of the goals as well as for maintenance of the services. Sure, that's, it's a lot to unpack, but I'll, I'll, I'll take yeah. a swing out here. So typically uh, for, for distribution builds or even on the transmission side, it, it can range anywhere from six months to uh, the better part of, of five to eight years, depending on the complexity involved. So. On a, on a typical small level uh, distribution upgrade, that, that may take about a year's time to procure, permit, uh, construct. Uh, but if you're looking at something uh, similar to you know, Article 7 processes on the transmission system where you're doing a large scale upgrade uh, on the bulk electric system, uh, you're looking at easily five years or more to, to really build out. I think looking at the longer scale, uh, you know, we are working hand in hand with not only the NISO and the Reliability Council, but also DPS on the state at large as we, you know, looking at the, the local transmission and distribution plans, uh, trying to identify areas where we've already got established plans within our existing capital programs that are there for an infrastructure need, but also reach for the needs to uh, aid in New York State's energy transition, so so-called phase one projects. As we move forward, we're looking more at, at multi-value projects, things that, that expand and, and unlock uh, there was those kind of constrained areas that Zach was speaking about on the map uh, as from the NISO standpoint to, uh, for us to, to achieve those. It is, it is going to take some time, uh, but we are, I think, laying the right groundwork today. Okay, great. Um, next question is, uh, you mentioned the importance of keeping all options on the table. Why is this so important and what role does biogas or RNG play? And is there enough RNG in New York to make a meaningful contribution to needed emissions reduction? Yes, thanks, John. Um, th this is an important question um, uh, regarding uh, what what there could be in terms of significant amounts of uh, available RNG to, to New York. And um, there have been some recent studies um, where there's an estimated in-state RNG potential in 2040 um, up to uh, a technical potential of 94 trillion BTU uh, per year from available landfill, animal manure, uh, wastewater treatment, food waste resources. And we do see this as getting to the heart of the affordability um, question uh, of, of having um, uh, the available system to help decarbonize what we have in terms of um, uh, flowing through our, our system. And also, um, uh, the, um, in terms of life cycle, greenhouse gas emissions, there is a difference with R uh, RNG as compared to um, uh, different methane, and uh, that needs to be accounted as, as we look towards um, uh, a solution. Okay, great. And then um, the, the last question I have here gets to that affordability, and the question is, would uh, the utility consultation group agree that customers need affordable electricity, and if so, how are you supporting those needs? Yes, John, affordability of, of this solution is um, um, very important. Um, we see this as part of um, us optimizing what the solutions are, um, given the need to maintain service that's reliable throughout the transition, and then Leveraging what we have in order to um, uh, optimize the, the outcome and, and the solutions. 
but um, to that end, um, we do see as a um, engagement with our customers. There's uh, certain investments from our um, industrial customers and, 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 and what they're going to have, to, what their um, investments for the future of, of their business would be. And then also um, looking for um, energy efficiency measures to help mitigate um, impacts of, uh, of, uh, of, of energy bills on our customers. Those measures are very important. The utilities are very focused on um, uh, delivering those energy efficiency programs. We see that as a key attribute of us being helping to, to, to uh, have our customers have affordable energy. Great, thank you. Um, and then uh, another question, should the utilities have consideration as DER distributed energy resource owners, which is counter to current regulatory direction as a mechanism to manage resiliency and reliability? Uh, yeah, I, th I think we should look at that dynamic. Um, you know, I, obviously, many of our many of the utilities within the utility consultation group are large, uh, multifaceted companies that have a, a large presence in the renewable generation output. Con Ed is is a good example of this, as is Avant Grid, not only in the U.S. but but across uh, across the world. Uh, we we should be able looking to try to leverage these uh, expertise as we try to. Path uh, to try to chart the path that is, as as Margaret said, kind of the, the least cost path that optimizes everything here. And this isn't simply a, a supply uh, a sided solution. We need to look at both supply and demand, and looking at as we add, you know, heat pumps across the board and 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 electric vehicles, finding ways to to mitigate the demand on the customer side. Obviously, we've 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 done great work over the last several years with energy efficiency, and we'll continue to do so, but examining all these different pathways to, to work to, to mitigate the overall uh, peak load impact will help, help reduce the amount of uh, infrastructure build that we will need to do on a, on a large scale basis across the state. Okay, great. Um, that looks like the questions we have. Um, so we'll, um, we'll close out this session and move on to the next, but, but uh, Margaret and Ryan, thank you very much for, for all of the information and, and, for, um, and for talking with, uh, talking at today's session. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Great. And um, following, uh, following Margaret and Ryan, we will move to a discussion on electric system planning for reliability and hear from Tammy Mitchell, the director of office, uh, the director of the Office of Electric, Gas and Water from the Department of Public Service. So Tammy, uh, over to you. Thank you, John. Good afternoon, everyone. As uh, you heard, my name is Tammy Mitchell, director of the Office of Electric, Gas and Water at the Department of Public Service. So one of the primary responsibilities of my office is ensuring the safety and reliability of the electric, gas, water, and steam systems in New York State. Staff of my office also is involved in setting rates for the utilities, as well as the environmental review and compliance oversight for new transmission and generation facilities. Today, I'm gonna provide an overview of how DPS staff and the Public Service Commission oversees planning of the electric system to ensure reliability. Next slide, please. So I'm first gonna talk about the DPS oversight role with respect to what I call traditional transmission distribution system planning in New York. Later on, I'll talk about how things are changing or need to change relative to planning and oversight to incorporate the achievement of our CLCPA goals. So I'll start with our oversight of the New York utility transmission distribution planning. So as you heard from the utility representatives, the utilities have an obligation to reliably serve their customers. In doing so, the utilities need to have adequate transmission and distribution capability. Reliability planning by the utilities is overseen by the Public Service Commission and DPS through various proceedings and activities. These include rate cases, where staff analyzes the need for proposed infrastructure projects as well as operation and maintenance programs, such as equipment replacements or vegetation management programs. The commission ultimately decides on the need for those projects, the main focus being whether such projects or programs are needed to maintain reliability of the utility's electric system. 
Staff meets with each of the utilities on a quarterly basis to review the status of those approved capital projects and O&M programs. Outside of the rate cases, the utilities are required to submit five-year capital investment plans, as well as long-term plans, which are typically 15-year plans, which staff also reviews. DPS staff also does a focused look at reliability prior to the summer and winter seasons to ensure that there are adequate available generation resources across the state and that each of the utility's electric systems are prepared to serve forecast load for those seasons and report our findings to the commission. DPS staff also investigates individual safety or reliability issues or complaints. This could be a major equipment failure or an individual business or customer safety or reliability complaint. The New York Public Service Commission has also established both safety and reliability performance mechanisms for New York State utilities. The safety standards relate to stray voltage testing and inspection of utility facilities. The reliability standards relate to frequency and duration of customer outages. Staff assesses each of the utilities' performance with respect to these metrics on an annual basis. Failure to meet the established targets can result in a negative re revenue adjustment for the utilities, and commission may also require corrective actions. As noted on this slide, all of these activities are part of the agency's standard regulatory oversight and day-to-day -day enforcement of electric safety and reliability. Next slide, please. I talked about some of the activities of DPS in overseeing electric system reliability. I'll now just mention a few of the factors that are considered in evaluating reliability. First of all, electric system reliability is constantly evaluated on both real-time and a forward-looking basis. With respect to some of the factors that are considered, fundamentally, the electric system needs to be designed to meet customer electric demand. The system needs to be designed to meet the peak demand, that's that one hour typically these days on a hot summer day, but it also needs to be flexible and able to meet instantaneous demand at any moment. At any time, there will be electric facilities, whether that be generation, transmission, or distribution facilities that are unavailable. This could be because of routine maintenance that's being performed on the facility or because there was an equipment failure. The system needs to be designed for these potential outages. We know weather can have a major impact on the system, and we look for the utilities to consider and invest in resilience measures. Regulatory requirements need to be incorporated in planning. I mentioned the Commission's reliability metrics, Utility system de design and investment needs to consider what is needed to achieve these and other regulatory requirements. A major driver in utility capital investment in recent years has been interconnection requests. These requests range from small distributed solar projects to utility scale wind and solar projects. The addition of these projects onto the electric system requires analysis of potential impacts to the system and system needs to address those impacts. State policy, of course, is also a consideration when planning the electric system. So I'll talk specifically about CLCPA shortly. Staff works closely with the utilities on these matters related to reliability of the state's electric system. And of course, the Public Service Commission has regulatory oversight and responsibility for ensuring the utilities maintain electric system reliability. Next slide, please. In addition to looking at utility planning for reliability, DPS staff is involved in the planning processes of other reliability organizations. For instance, DPS staff actively participates in the New York ISO planning processes that Zach described earlier. DPS um, participates in each of the planning processes and working groups, providing feedback and input, working collaboratively on addressing reliability issues and meeting the state's policy goals. I'll just mention that with respect to the public policy transmission planning, the Public Service Commission has to date identified three public policy transmission needs, or PPTNs, for competitive project solicitation through the process. Uh, Zach mentioned these earlier. They are the Western New York, the AC Transmission, and the Long Island Offshore Wind Export PPTNs. The Western New York and AC Transmission PPTNs resulted in projects that, were, that are currently under construction. The Long Island public policy transmission need was approved by the Commission in March. And in its March order, the Commission stated that the CLCPA is a public policy requirement, driving the need for additional transmission facilities related to the delivery of offshore wind. The Long Island PPTN has been referred to the New York ISO to solicit and evaluate potential solutions. In addition to participating in the New York ISO planning processes, CPS staff also participates in the New York State Reliability Council committees 
And one of my staff, Leka Jonai, is a board member of the Northeast Power Coordinating Council, or NPCC. NPCC is a regional reliability organization that, in concert with the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, or NERC, develops regional reliability standards and compliance assessment and enforcement for the Northeast, including New York State. So there are a number of venues DPS staff are involved in and a number of entities that we work with on electric system planning, planning and reliability. Next slide, please. I'm just gonna quickly go over a couple of examples related to reliability planning and the DPS or PSC role. The first is the Indian Point Contingency Plan. So in 2013, anticipating the possibility of the retirement of Indian Point and potential for reliability impacts, the Public Service Commission initiated a proceeding to establish a contingency plan. That plan was developed and implemented. It included various transmission projects that addressed the identified reliability issues. The investment in and construction of those projects allowed for the retirement of Indian Point units in 2020 and 2021 with no impacts to reliability of the electric system. Next slide, please. This other example, uh, which Zach covered earlier, uh, so I won't get into too much detail, but this was the DEC peaker rule. Um, as mentioned, the adoption of new regulations limiting NOx emissions from simple cycle combustion turbines or peaking units resulted in the identification of a reliability need. In response to the identified reliability needs, Con Edison proposed a solution, which was the construction of three new 345 KV feeders. Con Edison petitioned the Public Service Commission for approval and cost recovery for these proposed transmission projects. The PSC approved those projects in April of 2021. These projects, as Zach mentioned earlier, will eliminate the identified immediate, responsibility, <laughs> immediate reliability deficiency by allowing access to other New York City generation resources. Next slide, please. Now I'll talk about reliability planning as it pertains to public policy initiatives, in particular the CLCPA and the department's role. In response to the requirements of CLCPA and the Accelerated Renewable Energy Growth and Community Benefits Act, the commission issued an order on transmission planning on May 14, 2020. In that order, the PSC directed utilities to undertake a study and to propose a planning and investment framework for local transmission and distribution investments driven by CLCPA. This is where traditional reliability planning needs to be revamped to better consider public policy goals or mandates. Utilities historically have developed their transmission and distribution investment plans based on the need to meet reliability criteria and other factors such as the need to replace aging infrastructure that could lead to reliability issues. We're now asking the utilities to look at systems, system needs based on achieving public policy goals such as CLCPA. On November 2nd, 2020, the utilities filed the study results, including specific proposed projects, as well as their proposals for CLCPA investment criteria for future planning. At the same time, the utilities were studying their system needs in light of CLCPA. The PSC, along with NYSERDA, undertook two other studies, which were the offshore wind integration study, which identified possible grid interconnection points and offshore transmission configurations and assessed onshore bulk or high voltage transmission needs to reliably integrate 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind in generation. And the second one was the zero emissions electric grid in New York by 2040 study, which identified bulk transmission upgrades potentially necessary to support the state's path to 100% decarbonization of the elect electricity sector by 2040. The three studies together comprise what we call the power grid study. And this power grid study was filed with the commission on January 19th, 2021. Next slide, please. So continuing to touch on planning for CLCPA and the DPS's role, I'll just emphasize that maintaining system reliability is the cornerstone, cornerstone of all planning efforts aimed towards achieving the CLCPA goal. With respect to local transmission planning, DPS staff is working with the New York utilities on developing a framework and methodology for calculating headroom on existing transmission systems to assess to assist renewable project developers in identifying beneficial and cost-effective interconnection locations. 
We're also identifying cost-effective local transmission projects, which will improve on-ramps and off-ramps to the bulk transmission system. This will address potential, per, per, excuse me, this will address potential curtailment of renewable facilities and facilitate additional renewable energy to be delivered throughout the system. We are identifying generation pockets in regions of the state with significant developer interest and in addressing the electric infrastructure in these areas to reliably interconnect renewable resources. We are identifying public policy transmission needs for competitive project solicitation and procurement through the New York ISO's public policy process. I mentioned the uh, recent Long Island PPCTN that was uh, approved by the commission. We're identifying priority transmission projects, which require immediate action to address near-term system constraints and renewable energy integration and delivery limitations. The commission identified a uh, project in the North Country last October that will unbottle existing renewables in the area, and that project is now underway. And finally, we're evaluating and implementing advanced technologies to enhance the capability of the existing and future transmission distribution system. Next slide, please. In addition to planning on the transmission system to integrate large-scale renewables and maintain reliability of the high-voltage system, there's also planning with respect to the utility distribution system. For instance, utilities have an increase in capital expenditure to upgrade, upgrade distribution substations and feeders to increase hosting capacity for distributed energy resources. We're looking at opportunities for grid modernization, which include increased efforts in spending on advanced distribution management systems, BER management systems, AMI, and other advanced technologies to facilitate integration and optimization of distributed resources on the distribution system. We're looking at the potential impacts of increased penetration of electric vehicles and associated charging stations. This requires utilities to enhance their forecasting methodology and develop EV load, pro load profiles. And we're looking at energy storage systems, which can store renewable generation, smooth out demand profiles, and help meet the state's clean energy goals economically and efficiently. Next slide, please. Finally, I want to emphasize, as others have today, that the electric system is complex, and planning for a reliable grid is extremely complex. There are various capabilities and attributes that are needed to maintain reliability of the electric grid. I'll mention just a few because uh, they've, they've been covered by others, including the Reliability Council and New York ISO. So resource adequacy, this generally means that there's an adequate amount of generation resources to meet consumer demands. But as you heard, it's not as simple as it sounds. There's a technical definition of resource adequacy, which looks at statistical probability over a certain time of there being adequate resources to meet loads when taking into consideration potential generators not being available. So going forward, we're going to need to relook at that technical definition, given what the new resource mix and load profile will be, and also consider the cost of maintaining the current level of resource adequacy. Next is fuel diversity. We know that most renewables have intermittent output based on fuel availability, such as the sun or wind. A diverse resource fleet combining both intermittent and dispatchable resources is needed to maintain reliability. So you heard earlier Steve Whitley describe what dispatchable resources are. So those are resources that can adjust their output uh, on demand to meet instantaneous load. So that's something that is required to maintain reliability of the grid. Uh, you heard about fast ramping resources. Again, the ability to, for generators to start or stop on command and increase and decrease output quickly. Uh, future load shapes could lead to a need for more fast ramping resources to follow real-time demand. Black start capability was also mentioned. This is also extremely important. Uh, this is the ability for a generator to start operation without an outside electrical supply in the event that, that part of the grid goes down. Some resources, such as wind or solar, may not be capable of providing reliable black start capability. However, others, such as hydro or large battery energy storage, may have the potential, uh, and, that, and that's something we need to consider in the future. And finally, I'll just mention power flow dynamics. So historically, electric flows in New York have been from upstate to downstate, where the majority of the load is, with large amounts of renewables being added to the system, particularly significant amounts of offshore wind in New York City and Long Island. The way the, flower, the power flows across New York State um, 
and within any area, you know, can and will change. So this will impact the way the grid is reliably planned and operated in the future. So again, I, I point out just a few of these considerations. I highlight that planning for reliability is very complicated. It's not just about having enough total generation resources. The characteristics of those resources, as well as the characteristics of the demand on the system matter. Both of these will change significantly in the future and the electric system will need to be redesigned to reflect these changes. As you've heard today, from an engineering perspective, the designing the electric grid that will allow for the achievement of the state's clean energy goals appears feasible. However, this is a huge undertaking. We will essentially be redesigning the entire electric grid, changing it more than it's changed in over a century. This will require significant investment in transmission and distribution. Um, it will also require changes to traditional planning and modeling. And we will continue to see the development of new technologies that will help us achieve our goals, but we'll also need to ensure that these new technologies are tested to see how they interact on the system. In closing, we continue to move forward toward achieving the goal of a carbon-free electric system, and we're working hard to do so in a responsible and thoughtful way, so not to jeopardize reliability. That concludes my presentation. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today, and I'm happy to take questions. I'll just note that Leka Joe and I, uh, the chief of the department's electric safety and reliability section is also on the line today and available to answer any questions. Great, thanks Tammy. That was uh, really a good, good presentation and, and uh, thanks for all that. And um, a couple of questions and actually I might start with a question that I think I got lost in the shuffle over uh, between presentations, but I think it actually might be a question that uh, would be good to pose to you as well. Um, and wouldn't it be helpful to New York utilities to perform long-term climate impact studies, such as Con Edison did, to dig more deeply into the specific impacts of their own infrastructure, um, of the impacts of accelerating climate change on their own infrastructure? So how, how is the department looking at, at uh, that? Sure, uh, certainly as we've heard today, and we all know that the impacts of, of climate uh, change are significant. There have been various studies that have been performed relative to that. I will say that the utilities um, do look at uh, climate change and climate impacts um, when they are proposing projects uh, to, the, to the committee for approval in their um, rate cases. So that is currently a consideration. Um, I don't know that there has been a, a decision as of yet if there was going to be a, a requirement to do a, a standardized Climate, um, climate impact study by all facilities at this point. Great, thanks. Um, and then uh, two questions kind of getting a little bit at the same, so I'm gonna try to collapse them and maybe I'm making a bit of a presumption, but, but certainly as um, uh, we look at the CLCPA 2030 goal of 40% reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. There will no doubt be a large increase in electricity production for beneficial electrification of heating and transportation. Um, and then I think, and so has this become part of uh, the department's planning exercises? And then we also heard earlier from Zach Smith at NISO about um, the shifting in our system peak from summer to winter, and um, how do we think about um, the, the what is the biggest reliability challenge to such a drastic change in our peak demand? Sure, thanks. Good, good questions. So, uh, of course, um, you know the changing demand, the impact of electrification is is a major consideration. Um, so, when we undertook uh, you know, the, the components of our power grid study, certainly there were, um, you know, forecasts related to those, you know, as, as Zach pointed out earlier, um, you know, forecasts are very important. They're also very difficult. Um, we're looking out a, a long period of time and we're looking at changes that, you know, we can't rely on what's happened in the past because things are changing you know, much quicker than they have in the past. And, and we're gonna see significant changes both on the, the resource side as well as the demand side. And, and just one other note on that is, you know, a lot of, we're, we're planning for the entire system, but a lot of those impacts are very location specific. So it's not just a matter of forecasting how much 
uh, electrification there is going to be or how much renewable resources there is going to be. It, it very, the, the reliability impact is very dependent on the location of those resources. But certainly, we are taking those into consideration in any analysis we do. Um, again, you know, the power grid study, I encourage anyone who hasn't uh, to take a look at that. It was a very comprehensive study. Um, it has been filed. Again, it's in docket 20-E0197. Um, but this study was, you know, as comprehensive and detailed as it was, you know, there were various assumptions that were made, and we have results from that study that are directional and early indications of the impacts and, and the needs that we'll be facing for CLCPA. But I think as you've heard today, there is going to have to be continuous evaluation and, uh, you know, build on studies going forward so that we can take into account not only what we know today, but what we learn every day going forward on what's really happening in the system. Mm-hmm. Great, thanks. Um, so, uh, the, so I'm going to try to get this one through. So the utility group referred to the use of non-wires alternatives. And uh, given the projection of a 65 to 80% increase in electric demand um, has been noted in some of our analysis, um, initial analysis, um, to reach the decarbonization goals, the utilities available capacity of their distribution system, and they're looking at the utilities available capacity on their distribution system, can we develop longer term costs and priorities so that DERs such as microgrids and other market-based point of demand DERs can be part of upcoming rate cases. So how are, how is the department thinking about um, those um, emergent um, types of resources? So the, the department, you know, has been considering non-wires alternatives for a number of years. The utilities have been required um, when uh, requesting a, a project to look at a non wires alternative given the, the screening criteria that was set up. So that still continues to be a requirement um, and it will be going forward. Um, as far as prioritization and, and cost effectiveness, of course, those are going to be considerations. Um, you know, the, the commission has to develop a, a pursuant to the Accelerated Renewables and uh, Growth Act, has to develop a transmission distribution and distribution investment plan. Um, the utilities have filed. Uh, for certain projects, um, and those will be reviewed. And certainly a big consideration is, you know, what are the most cost-effective projects and how do we prioritize those? And that's something that we're working with the utilities um, going forward to incorporate in their planning processes. So now part of planning is not just, um, you know, meeting reliability criteria, but also incorporating into that um, the, any of the, the clean energy goals, but certainly DER will, will play a role with that going forward. Great, and uh, this is a point sort of getting to this, I think, again, like this may be some future learning opportunities. So, um, um, and it's getting to the issue of demand management, um, which is critical. And so here's one example of new ways of thinking of that. A home heated with a heat pump can store thermal energy for many hours meaning that it is not necessary to use peak hour electricity for these heaters if demand is managed. So thinking about such thermal storage, um, which is cheap um, and compared to grid scale electricity, like how, how would we look to a resource such as that on-site thermal energy that can be stored? So I don't know if I have a, an answer to that right now, but, but certainly mm -hmm. Any reason we're, we're going to need to look at everything going forward. Um, you know, I think you've heard that today. Any technologies, um, any resources, um, in order to have a reliable system. And I think demand side plays plays a huge role in that. It, it does today, and it will going forward. Great. Um, and I think uh, this next question I think is kind of getting to the same. So the reform, the energy vision, place to focus on supply, demand, co-location. Um, and the uh, Climate Act seems to emphasize large tracts of land or offshore resources, creating renewable energy generation pockets to achieve supply goals that do not necessarily solve load center challenges um, or even Rust Belt neighborhood capacity shortfall. So how can the 
commission look to those resources and ensure we balance the system along with reliability? All right, so, so I won't speak for the commission, but I, you know, I think again, as, as you're hearing, you know, that we're looking at a wholesale change to the electric system, and I think everything is on the table. Um, we talked about, you know, large scale renewables, we talked about, you know, load pockets, um, there's going to need to be transmission in order to deliver uh, some of the re large scale renewables out of load pockets. But a lot of this, especially that's going to be driven by electrification, is, is going to be um, very location driven, and it's going to be on the lower voltage system. And um, you know, we, we've seen this, and we will continue to see it, that there will be upgrades that are going to be needed um, to incorporate DER on the local transmission or distribution system, as well as to serve uh, the load and the load profile is going to be changing. So that's something we're going to have to keep a close eye on and we're going to have to prioritize investments in order to address any reliability issues that develop. Great, that's great, thanks Tammy. Um, and I'll give one uh, more minute in case there's another question um, to come up, but those were all the questions I've seen come through. Um, but if things do come through later, we'll be sure to um, to to um, get those questions answered. But in the meanwhile, we'll we'll just continue to move um, through the agenda. And uh, Tammy, thanks very much for um, the presentation and for um, for uh, discussing these issues uh, at today's session. Much appreciated. Thanks, John. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. And uh, after Tammy, we are going to move. Uh, to hear from Stephen Roundtree um, of Vote Solar. And if we can just move on to the next slide and get ready for Stephen's presentation. Great, Stephen, I will hand the mic over to you. Great, thanks so much. Um, are folks able to hear me? Or is anyone able to hear me? Yes. Coming through, great. Yep. Great. Um, great, so thank you all so much for taking the time uh, to have me as a part of this conversation. Uh, my name is Stephen Roundtree. I'm the Northeast Director at the Advocacy Organization Vote Solar, a national 501c3, focusing on um, you know, building a solar-powered world and doing it, um, doing it with social justice um, baked in. As well, um, you know, thank you to the state actors and particularly the decision makers who are listening in um, to take um, you know, the, the time to, to really dig in on this issue. Um, so, so much has already been said. I really am I'm here to focus on a couple of, uh, of sort of key points that are um, really important to vote solar in this conversation. And that is, you know, prioritizing renewables um, and, and focusing on social equity um, demand. So we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so, I, you know, I want to just take this time at 317 to reframe, like, why are we here? Right? And, and for me, it's climate disruption, toxic pollution are threatening our health and safety. They're threatening the future of the state uh, and the planet. Um, and I think the speakers who we've heard from already did a really great job of really explaining that, like, this is possible. Um, there's a lot of, you know, really advanced thinking on what is needed, what some of the challenges are, what the opportunities are um, to get to 100% renewable grid. Um, and, and, you know, it's also fair to say that we're here because it's the law and we're working on the implementation of a, of a, of a fully realized um, law. Um, and so I really want to focus my remarks or, or you know, direct folks attention as I deliver remarks on sort of like, what are the intermediate, like the sort of short term steps we can take um, to make sure that we're making the right choices now with such limited time uh, to make them. Um, so, uh, next slide, please. Um, so, the, you know, the key takeaways here for me are that a, as folks have mentioned, reliability is paramount, particularly for vulnerable communities uh, in the climate crisis. Um, integrating renewables onto the grid, in particular the distributed grid, while we're uh, maintaining reliability is possible, and in fact, it's cost effective. And I'll explain some examples there. Um, and three, aggressive adoption of renewables-based uh, grid, and in particular, renewables-based distributed grid. Um, is is arguably the only lawful path to de decarbonization and equity mandates, and I'll explain why that's my take um, in a moment as well. Um, so please go on to the next slide. So as I said, reliability is paramount. I think we've heard it from the utility folks, we've heard it from NISO, and, and it's certainly true, um, particularly for communities of color and low-income, uh, disadvantaged communities across New York State. Um, 
certainly interruption of electricity is just such a critical issue as uh, when we think about people's health, well-being, housing security, um, and really their their uh, physical health uh, in the moment where we're experiencing you know more uh, reasons to stay inside um, due to heat, smoke, rain, um, etc. So I just wanted to make sure that that was on people's minds as well. I'm um, thinking about the the critical nature of this issue. Um, and just move on to the next slide, please. Um, great. So next, the next sort of key point I want to make is that what from what we're learning and, and what solar has come to learn about um, modeling the grid in particular is that repowering or perpetuating fossil generation is not necessary for reliability. And I think that's part of that's part of our controversy here. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll say first that centralized fossil based grids are proving to be as unreliable um, as could be expected in a climate crisis, right? So we're looking at Texas uh, and the URI event. Um, right, um, New York City outages. We crept very, you know, very close to having um, to having outages in New York City um, in the heat wave. Um, certainly, these are of concern. Last year, or a few years ago, there was a there was a, there were outages in New York City caused by heat. Right, um, modernizing the grid really by taking an all of the above approach with you know demand flexibility, efficiency, um, DERs, um, which includes. Solar and storage, which I care about um, the most, but also EVs, microgrids um, is really where we need to be focusing our attention now and focusing state um, state investment. Um, you know, and finally, you know, renewables pair cost effectively here with local grid modernizing infrastructure um, like storage and microgrid tech, um, and we don't have to pay the the high external costs of fossil fuel, which aren't captured in the system. Um, so I want to double click on this a bit, and uh, we'll go move on to the next slide. So the first, you know, piece of piece of information, the first study I want to highlight here was a, 20, a 2019 Rocky Mountain in, uh, Institute um, study uh, that was examining, um, basically comparing the clean energy portfolio. That is a portfolio of um, demand response, you know, all, all the sort of renewable standard renewable technologies, right, and comparing that directly to existing combined cycle power plants, uh, and looking at the costs over time, and what. This this the study found was that you know over time, we're seeing it's well, a it's currently less costly um, to build out a clean energy portfolio, right? Than building, um, um, than building new fossil. Um, but also, you know, as soon as in 2025, it'll be less costly than operating existing gas plants, right? So I think that's that's something that that really needs to be said. First, for how we're making electricity in light of all the uh, the constraints um, of intermittent sources that that folks have identified earlier. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and I want to focus to and, and share um, a study, uh, sort of modeling exercise that Vote Solar uh, and a coalition called Local Solar for All um, put together at the end of last year, which I'm happy to share as well. Um, which referred to as our solar roadmap, but it really was an investigation of how to achieve the least cost 100% renewable electric grid across the US uh, under a, a, a few different scenarios. And you know, I urge folks to check the study out. I think it's really groundbreaking uh, in that it examines far more closely than has done uh, than has been done before um, the impacts of renewables on the distributed grid to whole system planning. Um, right, so taking like a much more um, granular approach at how um, renewable storage on the distributed grids on local grids um, can impact the bulk storage market. Um, I think really shed a lot of light on the opportunities for um, the opportunities for and sort of like the, the cost effectiveness of building out distributed renewables um, to a much higher degree on a much higher scale. Um, and, and, and hinting at that as, as a really important policy mechanism for, for states like New York moving forward. Um, and, you know, again, like, I just want to reemphasize re that, like, a grid um, that has the, you know, the highest degree of penetration of renewables, solar storage in particular, on the distributed grid actually represents the lowest cost overall build to 100% renewables um, nationwide. We're working on uh, a study for, for New York in particular that focuses on the state's um, milestones as well as the, the social justice uh, mandate. So people can stay tuned for that one, but I wanted to highlight what's up in, in, in the um, 
the national study. If you move on to the next slide, please. So this slide really you know, digs in a little bit deeper on, on that concept, right? And, and, and visualizes some of the benefit of, of um, distributed renewables to the bulk um, system. Right, so, you know, there's a lot here, but basically what I want to show people is on the lower, lower um, set of um, graphs there, you see a grid that has a higher penetration of DERs. Um, and, and what you're looking at is a much more leveled out demand um, curve over over a period of days. Uh, this is like this is a summer example. Um, and what that does is it allows the um, the bulk um, bulk power system to be you know far less stressed by the impacts that are coming from um, changes in, in in demand and consumption. So I guess for the, the for the DEC folks on the call, like I, I think we think about uh, distributed renewables and um, having a more sort of responsive distributed grid as like a wetland and, and um, sort of taking the role that a wetland has in, in the water cycle where it's creating a buffer um, for stresses and shocks um, and, and sort of making, um, you know, holding the, the variability in the bulk system um, sort of less, um, less able to cause um, shocks and impacts uh, to the rest of the system. Um, so let's move on to the next. Right, and this has been brought up, you know, in full cloth before, but I really wanted to to just um, use the example of the Con Ed Trace um, project, which which stands for you know transmission and reliability and clean energy, as a response to the Pika rule, um, as just evidence of this being a, a path forward that can be adopted and and something that can be done um, at speed and and that can avoid you know the worst impacts of the fossil um, the fossil um, economy on communities of color uh, in New York City and elsewhere. Um, so we can move on from there to the next slide. Thank you. Um, and just wanted to, to hit the third point that local generation and storage promotes social equity. Um, and it, it promotes social equity, and it's certainly consistent with social equity. Um, with um, you know, obviously, the need for public policy to sort of make um, make the, the rubber hit the road there, right? So obviously, like we're talking about how we're maintaining reliability in our grid. You know, obviously, fossil pollution, you know, is causing public health challenges, which are somewhat outside this conversation, uh, I, I think, and, and it's sort of, if we're talking about costs, and, and I, I'll i note that costs have not been the front of the conversation, I think, because we all understand where we need to be, um, but it's certainly important to look at what's not sort of captured in the system of how we change our electric system, like, but what are the costs to people who have to live um, in proximity to these, um, to these polluting uses? Um, and so, you know, with that in mind, you know, building renewables, batteries, microgrids in these high load areas, of the state, um, which are disproportionately disadvantaged communities, their population centers, um, they're, they're folks who are living in, in, in higher density with more electric load, right? Um, the state investing in these areas is, in my, in my opinion, the best way to make sure that A, we're having the grid we need, which I've just explained was the lowest cost, um, according to the models we're using. Um, and then you're also saying in doing so you can deliver direct, um, like articulable, like tangible benefits to members of disadvantaged communities, um, in the event of, of a climate stress or shock. Um, right. And then also, you know, prioritizing, like I said, prioritizing, um, investment in these communities is actually going to help get the state to where it can count the dollars at the end of the day or count the impact in the, the day by whatever metric it's using and say like, yes, we succeeded in making sure that 35, 40% of benefits um, of the transition to clean energy were, um, were actually landing in disadvantaged communities where, where the law requires they, um, they land. Um, so next slide, please. Great, um, just wanted to double tap two on energy efficiency demand response saying the same thing. Um, if we're investing in disadvantaged communities with regards to energy efficiency, we're obviously lowering demand overall, but importantly, you're, you're providing benefits in the sort of social um, health, uh, other socioeconomic um, portions of that conversation. Um, also, demand response, you know, is really important to this conversation as well. I've highlighted just the image of, um, of June 30th there um, in New York City, just something as simple as the text from Con Ed um, for folks to to note that we're experiencing um, 
possible reliability issues and to take some steps in their use. Um, you can see that little um, the little right hand turn that the that the demand curve took and and, and really um, wanted to focus on you know the power of of taking steps like creating uh, better communication, um, better engagement with communities on 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 demand response um, and 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 rewarding users for demand response um, in that conversation as well. Um, so next slide, please. Great. Um, and then this is sort of just my take, and I know I know I share it with others, but you know the the lawfulness of new fossil is unclear in the situation. I think we we really need to focus on, for me, understanding that the law requires that agency decisions you know need to comply with CLCPA climate targets. Um, you know, if not, there's process um, that um, you know to the the credit of folks in particular at DC, like they're they're walking these paths, and I, and I commend them for walking the paths that they're walking and. Um, want um, folks to continue to keep their eye on that, um, but the scoping plan really should hear these work work requirements. Um, thinking about if we're building fossil, does that on its face disproportionately you know disadvantage communities of color and low income, which arguably it does, um, um, and keeping it on, on you know on on folks' radar as as we're as we're moving through um, the process here, um, given like I said here the harm. Um, that fossils causing and the viability cost effectiveness um, and myriad benefits of the alternatives. Um, so, so that is that that was a, uh, that was it. I think I just spit that quite quickly here at the end of the afternoon, but I'm happy for that to be the case and. We're looking forward to hearing folks questions. Like if I can answer them, I will, if I want to, you know, be better to refer back, I will do that as well and circle around. Great. No, thanks very much, Stephen. That was really very good. And um, uh, a couple of questions have come in for you. So, um, first, um, so what is your thought on the location issue between the where renewables tend to be built, right, where the resource is, versus where the electricity is needed? And also, does your less costly example, I think in the study that you had cited, account for the additional transmission required to connect the generation to uh, to load power? Um, sure, so I'll answer the second one first, and yes, it does. Um, I, I, I really urge people to, to dig into the, the, the study, and um, I would love to, if I can get it into the chat before we, we end here, I'd like to, um, but otherwise we'll certainly um, follow up and, and, and I'm definitely invite further engagement on that one. So, so yes, it does. It does um, include transmission concerns for sure. Um, the first part of that question was talking about issues of geolocating generation versus like final offtake for um, for for renewables in particular solar. So this is a complicated issue, um, like, as we know. I think obviously, like it has a, it has a, a, you know physical implications as well as sort of. Um, Sort of social implications, right? Um, and, and I think um, for me, it feels as though, and I think partners I've talked to will tell you um, that there's a great opportunity um, to be making sure that solar, this, you know, solar energy that's generated anywhere in the distributed grid can be accessed anywhere. And obviously, you have physical constraints in places like New York City to where um, folks are getting electricity. Um, but and, and, you know, I think that's really important. That should be that should be the way we move forward. Um, to to enable those sort of transactions across utility lines, but I also think it's critically important to, you know, keep in mind and, and respect the fact that benefits the benefits of building solar where you live and where you can help be a part of that economy and where you can have an ownership stake, um, and where electricity you know electricity generated can also you know relieve load, um, but also be generating um, you know revenues um, for folks, um, keep job growth going, get people in the door. Um, in the, the solar economy is also hugely important. So I think the state taking a role of truly, truly both and and, and not um, not abandoning one approach for the other is really important. Great. Great. And uh, maybe this next question is uh, connected to that too, because it talks about local generation and point of use battery storage prevents distributed energy flexibility while bringing the value okay. of resiliency into the hands of the consumer. Given the intermittency of large scale renewables, battery storage provides us solutions. Um, however, this approach still relies on rebuilding transmission and distribution. What priority does your group place on demand versus supply solutions? This is a tough one. Uh, I, you know, I, I think I, my instinct tells me to not talk out of turn on this one. I, I think I, I need to learn more about it to, um, 
to understand that issue in particular. I think we feel like also we think it's it's all important, um, and that because there's so many different um, sort of benefits there. I mean, like what 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 I can say is that you know there's no there's no um, you know it, it's not like a competitive um, conversation between you know utility and distributed supply. I think obviously like we you know if we're looking at an 80 percent electrification regime, which I think we we are, and this is sort of what Vote Solar uses um, when we're thinking about the scenarios. Like you need um, to be shooting our shot um, at, at both um, levels of abstraction. So yeah, don't have an amazing answer for you now, but I will look into it and, and report back to the group. Great, thank you very much. That that would be good. Uh, next question. Uh, some of the earlier speakers implied a role for renewable natural gas and for hydrogen. What is your view on the public health aspects of these resources? Um, good question as well. You know, I, again, like I'm not, um, you know, I'm not a technologist as such, but I think like what what I would offer to you and what I've offered as a member of the the Power Generation Advisory Panel um, in this regard. Um, is for the state to be focusing on technologies that, that they know work and they know can scale. And, and I think, you know, doing research on nascent technology is important um, and understanding what the capabilities of, of, um, of technologies like that are important. But I think we really need to, to really be focused on avoiding false solutions to the problem where, you know, clean hydrogen, as I understand, which is a like pretty elemental understanding of it, you know, if we're if we're using um, if we're using available renewable capacity to to create the stuff and it's being used judiciously, then sure, there's a world in which that's important. Um, but I think there's also, you know, it's also part of the world where you're you're using that as sort of a, a cover to continue building a, a gas pipelines and talking talking through that conversation. I think it's like that's where the alarm bells need to be running for people and saying like this isn't worth the confusion and it isn't worth the chance that this goes wrong or this this isn't resolved in the next 10 years um but rather saying we need to focus our you know our state resources on what we know is going to work and and, and what we know is is a solution that that's not um fraught in this way but but again that, that's that's without the granular understanding of, of some of these texts that i know others have Okay, great. Thanks very much, Stephen. And I might just give it a few more seconds if another question will come through. Um, that's uh, that's the questions we have for now, but um, certainly we can always reach back out again if uh, further questions come up. Um, but uh, much appreciate um, the presentation today, Stephen. That was a um, great discussion. And um, uh, thanks again for sharing all the good thoughts um, at our session today. Really appreciate it. Of course, my pleasure. Thank, thank you all again. Great. Okay. Thanks. Okay. And um, with uh, with that, we shall move to the next speaker, um, who is going to be Aaron Hogan. Um, and Aaron heads up the uh, utility intervention unit at the Department of State. So, Aaron, I will hand the mic over to you. Thanks, John. Good afternoon. For those who are not familiar with our little group, we are statutorily responsible for representing the interest of customers before the Public Service Commission and at the New York ISO. While reliability is incredibly important to consumers, so too is cost. The past 16 months has been in incredibly challenging, but in many respects, it has been a remarkable period for the advancements in widespread adoption of communication tools. These tools had been available for a number of years and used predominantly in business in some education settings. During COVID, however, these tools became more ubiquitous by being used not only to conduct business meetings, but also enabled families to have game nights, wedding celebrations to be shared, and even funerals to console those in mourning. While these tools have facilitated business and personal connections to continue, they have not been without problems or interruptions to service, to the angst of the users. Today, we are discussing the reliability of the electric system that in many ways functions like the virtual communication system we rely on for work and family connections today. Like the communication system, our electric grid will be expected to adopt new technologies 
or use existing technologies in a more widespread manner. In the virtual communication system, if connectivity does not work, the cascading effect on others is limited. In the electric system, that is not always the case. Given the fact that this evolution of the electric system is expected in a very short period relative to the, its inception, reliability should be front and center of the CAC scoping plan. Next slide. As Peter Fox Penner of the Institute of Sustainable Energy wrote in his Power After Carbon, Building a Clean, Resilient Grid, in a nutshell, our challenge is to steer clear of the technical and institution pathway that together yield poor service, expensive power, or a failure to decarbonize quickly. Let's consider this suggestion in the context of the CLCPA goals. A successful implementation plan would have self-motivated, widespread adoption of electrification encouraged by reasonable cost and reliable service. An unsuccessful implementation would discourage electrification due to high cost and unreliable service. To avoid an unsuccessful implementation plan, UIU is asking that reliability be a top priority in the scoping plan while containing the cost. One without the other could impact the success of meeting the CLCP goals. Next slide, please. In the assessment of risk, let's consider what's more reliable and reflect on the evolution of the grid. Is, is a grid that has a few pieces of equipment, such as a single large generator serving a single load through a single transmission line reliable? This type of system was in place before 1920 when an individual utility with no assistance from another utility provided service to its customers. This type of system is a similar concept to a microgrid with one generator, except a microgrid is limited in geographic area and continues to rely on the utility in the event of a failure. Next slide. Or is a more reliable system the one with more pieces of equipment that must work together, such as multiple large generators serving multiple loads through a network transmission system delivered via distribution systems? This is the type of system that has evolved over the past 100 years, which has offered enormous scale of, um, economies of scale and improved reliability by diversifying sources. While this was an improvement over the single system structure, it has not been without its problems. Most notably in New York, we've experienced widespread outages such as the blackout of 1965, the Northeast blackout of 2003, and Superstorm Sandy. Lessons learned from the daunting experiences informed the development of new structures, operating protocols, and design considerations to improve reliability. Next slide. Or is a more reliable system the one that is envisioned in approximately only 20 years that consists of many more pieces of equipment that must work together? This system will likely include multiple large intermittent generators serving various dynamic loads, including batteries, that are also served by various local intermittent resources delivered via a network transmission system to multiple distribution system. Is this expected structure an improvement to economies of scale and reliability? Will the system's performance and cost encourage electrification? Only time will tell. Next slide. Regardless of the new generating technologies, one variable remains the same. Generation, even electrons from storage, must balance load, as described earlier. Of load, generation, and transmission, predicting load in the long term, as both Zach and Tammy discussed, even with the new utilities forecasting methods, will probably be the most challenging for the planners so that they don't over or underbelt. If one expected outcome, such as energy efficiency, does not achieve its goal, the planning studies may be compromised. For example, if electrification of buildings occurs before the building is weatherized, 
the electric demand in the winter may increase earlier than expected. If there's an accelerated adoption of electric vehicles, particularly heavy duty vehicles, this too could impact how the system should be planned. The futuristic scenarios of electric vehicles backfeeding a home or grid sound fantastic. But if there is a long term outage, particularly in cold weather, when batteries discharge at a faster rate, then reliance on the, the source may be inappropriate. Additionally, there was a question earlier asking regarding heat pumps being able to store energy. This may help on the supply side, but can it help to contain the cost of the investments needed in the distribution and transmission system? DR was also just recently discussed in the previous speaker. DR is used in the reserve margin studies, but is it appropriate to size T and D investments with the expectation of persistent response of load? What Zach suggested planning study consider bookends if the unknowns are too great and to avoid compromising studies, planners may likely assume the worst and potentially overbuild the system at a potentially significant and long-term cost to ratepayers. For this reason and the and in the light of the need to maintain reliability, the upcoming build out is an enormous financial risk to ratepayers. In a perfect world, we would have Goldilocks conditions, not too much, not too little generation, transmission to meet the load at the right time and in the right location. This is unlikely to happen perfectly. Sizing transmission and generation is very chunky. Consequently, during the transition, like in the past, we will have periods of excess capacity in the anticipation of the increased electric load. Yet, if planners are oversizing with the expectation of new load and it does not come to fruition, then consumers will be paying for infrastructure it does not need. Next slide, please. The timing of the investments could also affect the willingness to electrify. Consumers will be confident in the system when the costs are reasonable. Some investments in the utility systems are needed due to its end of useful life. Some of these can be upgraded to contain cost, but if these incremental costs drive up the rate significantly, then customers may look to alternatives. Please keep in mind that capital cost is not a one-to-one -one impact to the utility's revenue requirement and rates. I raise it here so you understand that's important to consider the rate impacts, not just capital cost. As an example, a high capital cost investment with low O&M cost and long lived may have a lower impact to revenue requirement than a lower capital cost investment with high operation and maintenance cost, but shorter lived. Additionally, how these costs are allocated amongst service classifications can impact rates and thus the willingness to electrify. Next slide, please. Undoubtedly, like in many complex long-term plans, the CAC and its scoping plan will highlight its known or expected strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Yet even before the next update to the scoping plan, there could be conditions that are unexpected and not captured in your initial SWOT assessment. How these unexpected conditions impact the performance of the transmission and distribution systems could be significant and perhaps costly. As the planner and planners and operators prepare the power system for the new paradigm, embarking on an evolutionary task in a very short period of time, the risk that a critical component is missing increases. They have and will, as described earlier, continue to evaluate different conditions and develop mitigation, if necessary, through new equipment and or operating protocol. But to identify the mitigation, one first needs to assess whether there is a problem. And those assessments may need to be fluid and may take additional time. Next slide, please. Therefore, UIU suggests that the CAC scoping plan support reliability by allowing flexibility in the future adaptations of the scoping plans. The scoping plan should highlight areas of known risk and allow those responsible for reliability of the transmission and distribution grid 
to have the flexibility and adequate time to mitigate those risks. Such flexibility is not in conflict with the CLCPA goal, but instead supports such goals in a thoughtful and informed manner that acknowledges and prepares the electric system for future generations. Thank you. Great, thank you, Aaron. Uh, much appreciate um, all of your presentation. Um, and we've got um, at least one question here and we'll see if our further ones come in. But the question is um, thinking about all of the um, considerations that you've um, put before us. And um, the other consideration is how to account for the current cost of climate damage and human health. And that the official position of the state from the DEC last December is $125 a ton of CO2, um, more for methane, um, just for climate damage. And, um, you know, other research demonstrates that um, the human health cost of fossil fuels um, can be over $700 billion per year. So how, I guess the question is really about how do we balance um, considering um, other um, social costs? of um, potential inaction. So my interest is to keep the cost to the consumers on the utility side as low as possible. The goals of the CLCPA are there to mitigate mm -hmm. those burdens on the climate and health side. The, the tricky part I view for the CAC is how do we keep cost on the distribution and transmission side down on the delivery side down such that it encourages the electrification that is being sought? And I'm not sure the correct answer is because we don't know what we don't know. So, as Tammy described, they have non wire alternatives that are there to help bridge where there might be a need for transmission. So, it's an attempt to try not to overbuild too quickly. In light of the utilities, local transmission and distribution investment plans and those significant costs that will be addressed the phase one in upcoming rate cases, but the phase two will be addressed later. The cumulative cost and what that means to rates, the delivery side could be significant and could, might not be able to be answered with non wire alternatives. So, if people want to achieve the goals, I'm just suggesting be very careful on what happens to the utility cost and how we transition over to that system because it could be an impediment from reaching those goals. Great, thank you, Erin. Um, and I'll just give it another second for any um, other questions um, through the Q&A. Okay. And maybe not seeing anything come through um, immediately. Um, I'll just say thank you, Aaron, for the presentation and for um, the thoughts that you're putting on the table today and, and much appreciate the participation in the session today. Thanks for having me, John. Okay, thank you. And um, with um, our previous presentation, that brings us actually to the close of our agenda today. Um, thanks to all of our presenters. Um, we certainly had a full afternoon of, of really very substantive presentations. So much thanks for the preparation and the presentations um, today. And thank you to all of our participants for all the very thoughtful questions and, and, um, and thoughts for further consideration. And um, if we have not been able to get to all of those um, questions today, we will look for ways to make sure we can um, provide responses to any of the questions that we were not able to address today. Um, a reminder that um, this presentation today has been recorded and the video recording will be placed on the 
Climate Action Council's website, that's climate.ny.gov, uh, climate excuse me, um, as well all of the slides will be um, put on the um, website along with the video as well. And when you get to the Climate, um, Climate Action Council website, you will see the events tab and you'll see the information for today's reliability um, speaker session and uh, that's where you will find the video and uh, all of the slides for today. And with that, um, I think I will call today's session closed and thank you everyone again for your uh, participation today.